you can uh, I hope that you can uh, follow me through. Okay. Thank you. Right. So we start from very basic, a uh, very fundamental question on what is the purpose or what are the purpose of doing laboratory testing? I, I think uh, most of you will be able to answer that. Well, I think number one is we are trying to determine the true value of the analyte that uh, in a given sample. Well, when somebody sent you a, a, a bottle of water and say, can you determine the copper content for me? So the water sample has a certain amount of copper level, copper content. But uh, when you carry out laboratory analysis, no matter how many times you repeat and so on, you will never get the same answer. So you come up with an average value. But that average value, is it close to the actual value that is in the sample or not? Frankly speaking, we don't know, all right? We actually, we would not know the true value of the analyte in a given sample. Why? Because it is just, uh, I don't know, you cannot see through, isn't it? So what you need to do is, you must have find a way to determine how good or how close is my result to the true value, okay? So when we say, when I repeat several times, I don't get the same answer, that is because there is a random error in our uh, so-called sort of a laboratory analysis. That can be due to several uh, variation that we cannot control, like your instrument signals, like your individual personal methodologies and so on. So actually, when we say we have a measure value, we say we have an error. The error is your measure value different from the true value. Yeah, um, we cannot hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, where, where did, right from the beginning or, or only now? Yeah, just now only, yeah. So, yeah. Just now, uh, okay. All right. So, we just, uh, uh, just may I continue there? Now, whatever we do, we are trying to determine the true value of the analyte in, in a given sample. But because of the variability of the test, we don't get the same answer and uh, we can't even be very sure whether our average value is the true value or not, okay? So the, the difference between the measure value and the true value, we call it an error. That is actually a random error most of the time. So the question now is, then how do you know that your analysis is accurate? Your analysis is uh, giving a result that is close to the true value. Well, Although we do not know the analyze a true value in a given sample, but actually we can analyze some similar samples which contain the known value simultaneously so that we can do the test parallelly. And if we were to get a good recovery of the result from the sample that we have a known value, then we should be able to be confidently to release the result on the samples given to us. So what are the type of samples that we, with a known value? Well, the first one will be the certified reference value, for example. When you run the test on the sample, you run parallelly with a certified reference material. So the reference material has a certified value and then you just have to compare how good is your result uh, is it almost 100%, 99% recovered, uh, recovery from the known value? If you are so, then you are accurate. Then you can be confident that uh, the analysis on the sample is also has an equal amount of confidence. 
So the sample with a known value can be a certified value. It can be even a known value, known previously, or even uh, somebody give you a value, say, I, I know the result is such amount. Then you just let you see how you can get the result close to that figure or not. Another way, of course, is the spike value, where you can uh, add a known amount of the analyte in the similar matrix, in a matrix that is a blank. That means uh, the blank means that uh, the matrix does not have that particular analyte, and you add in a known amount. So in that case, you know the figure, and let's see whether you can get the, uh, you can recover that particular figure or not. Or another way is uh, if you still have your uh, re remaining samples from your PT program, proficiency testing program. So when the reports of the PT uh, exercise has come back to you, which shows the average value or the mean value, in that way we call it a consensus value given by the participants. That means uh, the re average result by the no acceptable results from the participants, then that is called a consensus value, which you can use it as another uh, sample that has a given value for you to check your accuracy. But of course, you must remember all these so-called values given to us, it has their certain amount of uncertainty. So that is the first purpose of doing testing is we want to find out the actual value of the analyte in a given sample. Secondly, you are testing on samples, but most of the time, the clients, the data user, the, the, the end user of the report is not interested in the result, uh, the result in the sample. Instead, actually, they are interested to know the result of the population from where the samples are drawn. So in that case, your test result must be able to give a certain degree of confidence when uh, you report the result, hoping that your result is as close as well, as close as the true value of the population as well. Okay. So that if that is the case, we need to talk about some probability distribution function. And generally, we always talking about our result in terms of 95% confidence. In other words, we are talking about 5% allow, allowable error. So these are the two fundamental purposes for doing laboratory testing. So when we carry out laboratory testing, what is what are our ultimate aims? Well, we hope the, the result generated are accurate, precise, reproducible. And then if you are talking about trace level analysis, you hope your result can go to as low possible detection limit. And ideally also the result can be generated fast and economical. Okay. Now, whatever you do, at the end of the day, your test result must be fit for purpose. Fit for whose purpose? Fit for your client's purpose. It must be able to meet your data user's requirement. If not, the result it just doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything to the data user. So, what is the what are the types of uh, quality criteria that we are talking about? I just want to focus on one of the criteria that is result reproducibility. Our test result, hopefully should not be significantly different from the result produced by another laboratory under different test condition on the same sample by the same method. Why? Because in case of dispute of your test result, there is always requirement for retesting. For retesting means the test will be done by another laboratory. And of course, when we generate our test result, we are uh, must be confident that this result can be challenged. This result can be reproduced by another laboratory. Okay, so your reproducibility 
or is always judged by the inter-laboratory comparison. Oh. Why reproducibility is important? It is important, particularly in product conformity testing to meet the specification limit or the product testing to meet the regulatory limit or when you have a dispute between the supplier and the, the, the buyer, the supplier and the buyers, then you have to be uh, so-called, uh, be able to stand by your result against the particular dispute, particularly uh, on the specification conformity. So that is one of the important points that when we carry out analysis is we have to make sure we are able to stand a challenge. To stand a challenge means your result must be reproducible by another laboratory. Sorry. So, so to so we can be very proud of our high level of technical competence. We can talk about how accurate we are, but people would look at it that it is subjective. So what is the best is that if your, 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 your level of technical competence can be assessed and can be recognized by another third party. By a third party, that is by an objective assessment, okay? And because if you have a, a particularly if you are doing sort of a laboratory service business where you are subject for uh, so-called uh, subject for retesting or subjected for, for kind of a recheck on your result, particularly like you do any uh, shipment analysis, then of course, ideally is that if you are very competent with your result, then there is no need to be retested. The sample need not be retested by your buyer. Okay, But all this, you need somebody as a third party to give you that kind of recognition. So is there a means to rec for recognizing the technical infrastructure and output from one country in another country as being equivalent? If that is answer is yes, then I think that is a good uh, so way to cut down any retesting uh, at the other side. Well, there is. There is such a thing called accreditation. Okay, accreditation is a process to give a test laboratory an independent and formal recognition of its technical competence to perform specific tests by a national accreditation body. So, for example, like in Singapore, then the national accreditation body is actually called SAC Singlas. Singapore Accreditation Council, Singapore Laboratory Accreditation Scheme. Okay, now this is a formal way, accreditation is a formal way to recognize, to determine and promote the ability of your organization to perform specific tests, specific scientific activity. Actually, it does not really fully cover testing and calibration, but actually accreditation and also cover inspection body pro PT providers. So activities in accreditation can be uh, as what I have listed here, okay? Under testing, it covers all kinds of testing that you can think about, okay? From chemical, biological, uh, environmental, medical, electrical, mechanical, non-destructive testing, et cetera, et cetera. And accreditation activity also can be covered by calibration. It can be also for inspection body, for people carry out sampling, but they don't do testing, but they send the sample to your lab to do testing. Uh, there are there are such kind of business, particularly like they, we call it a uh, marine surveyor, cargo surveyors. Some cargo surveyors don't have, cargo surveyors don't have the lab. So, but they go and do the inspection of the goods and they take samples and then after that they send the sample to a lab for analysis. They also can be accredited today, okay? 
and of course proficiency testing provider. Now all these accreditation system all based on ISO 17025. Okay, it's called ISO IEC 17025 standard. This is a standard developed with an objective to promote good laboratory practice and also to provide confidence in the laboratory operation. Okay. So what it is the standard? What is inside the standard? It has given a list of requirements for the lab to demonstrate that they can operate the lab competently and be able to generate valid results. When we say valid result means the result is acceptable, are acceptable by the end user. Okay. So upon successful assessment by SAC Singlas, for example, then the laboratory will be awarded an accreditation certificate attesting the quality of the work done. Now, if we search a recognition, actually it also facilitates the acceptance of your test result between countries. If, uh, if the, the local accreditation body has entered a MRA, Mutual Recognition Arrangement Agreement, with another economy. Okay, uh, I will come to that a little bit just a short while later. Okay, so meaning that uh, with based on the ISO 17025 standard, your report will be recognized by another party uh, who is in another country, which also recognizes 17025. Okay, so what is 17025 is all about? Well, the title is called general requirement for the competence of testing and calibration laboratories. So it is actually trying to uh, get accredited laboratory to provide standardized good laboratory practice and to promote the data users confidence in the laboratory operation. In fact, it will be interesting, interesting to know that 17025 is actually ISO 9000 equivalent. Okay, it will generally be equivalent with the principle of ISO 9001. So, so sometimes people may be a little bit confused between the two words, certification and accreditation. Okay, now certification like ISO 9000, 14000, or 18000, and so on. Actually, they are talking about having a standard to build out a quality system and quality system will cover whatever activities you do and do it consistently, full stop. That is certification. Accreditation has added an, an element of a third party evaluation of your technical competence. That is the key word, technical competence. So if you have uh, ISO 9000, it does mean you are 17025 uh, uh, equivalent. But you have 17025 equivalent, actually you can claim that I am 9000 equivalent. But you have one extra thing to, to, to be assessed. It is your technical competence uh, by technical uh, assessor. And as well as you must take part in proficiency testing to show that your results are comparable with any other, la other laboratory. So this, I, this uh, accreditation business is a big, big business, okay? It is a worldwide cooperation on accreditation. The big umbrella is called ILAC, International Lab Accreditation Cooperation. And this ILAC has several regional bodies. And where are we? Actually, we are in under this APAC, Asia Pacific Accreditation Cooperation. So ILAC runs a mutual recognition arrangement agreement uh, system. And all the laboratories under individual accreditation bodies, they are signatories to this MRA. Uh, if you are the signatory of the MRA, then the reports in country A will be recognized in the country B. Uh, if the country B has also 
is also a signatory to this MRA. So the purpose of MRA is very simple. They want to have a sit situation that once tested, accepted everywhere. This is a kind of slogan they use uh, to, to say that uh, your report will be acceptable by another country without further testing if you have uh, under the same accreditation standard 17025. So you might be wondering how this scheme is going about, okay? But basically it's very straightforward. We are laboratory here in Singapore and there is a laboratory in Thailand. Now to get a mutual recognition, each of them must be accredited by their local accreditation body. In Singapore, we have SAC Singlas. In Thailand, there is Milas. Now, these two accreditation bodies must also be mutually recognized, mutually recognized through a ILEX arrangement for peer evaluation process. So, accreditation bodies are also subject to assessment, like laboratory are subjected assessment by accreditation body, accreditation body are subjected to be assessed by their peer evaluation. Once everybody is happy, then they can sign the MRA between country A and country B. And so it goes down to your laboratory also will be recognized, mutually recognized based on, on your test score. So in general, I think you can see there are so many beautiful logos uh, of national accreditation scheme, all right? Singlas got the logo here, and PAF, if you know, that is tai Taiwan, Taiwan Accreditation Foundation. Khan is a committee, Accreditasi National, so you know what? Indonesian, all right? Sinas, China, Koras, Korea, Hoklas, Hong Kong. This one is a stamp for Malaysia, and then this is the Thailand, and then this is the Vietnam and so on. Okay. And this is Philippines. So you can see that uh, many, many countries are, uh, are having their accreditation scheme in place. Okay. Now, if you are really curious about this 17025 of the history, it can be very easily traced back to 1978 when there was an ISO guide 25. And then over the years, because of the development of ISO 9000, so it also involved from guide, <coughs> from guide to become full standard, okay? IEC joined in because they, it is also recognized that electrical testing is equally important. So they also joined in, in and that is the way, uh, that's how they developed into a full standard in a 2017 with a third edition. Now, you might be also curious, who started all this business of accreditation? Well, if you want to know, that is for the one, NASA. Who is NASA? NASA is a National Association of Testing Authorities of Australia. Australia. In fact, it is over one of the, in fact, it is the most uh, the earliest, the very first accreditation body in the world is done by Australia. Uh, the reason for Australia to have the accreditation body way back in 1948 was because the government recognized the importance of testing the mine, mining sample. Australia is very famous for mining, so they don't want to waste all the effort of uh, exploration and mining uh, after finding out that the laboratory results are not reliable. So that's how they started the accreditation scheme way back in 1948. Then over the years, it developed into a big business. In fact, it started uh, very small, just a few countries involved, but way after 1977's uh, ILEC conference, they call it uh, they formed the, they formed this group called ILEC. NASA was a leader for that, and uh, they formed the call that ILEC. It was then called International Laboratory Accre Accreditation Conference. They started as a conference, 
And then over the years, more and more countries find it interesting, uh, find the, the, the accreditation idea is worth a while doing it. So it become a big, big uh, uh, business today, okay? So in St. Glass, in Singapore, St. Glass actually was launched quite early, way back in 1986. And that time it was under the purview of CI, SI, SIR, CISA. After that, in 1996, government formed a council, Singapore Accreditation Council, uh, between MPI, uh, Ministry of Trade and Industry, and the uh, SCI, Singapore Confederation of Industry. And then they started to run a field certification and accreditation scheme, and Singlas is one of them, right? So Singlas joined in the MRA, in fact, it was one of the inaugural, means the very first batch signatories of MRA way back in 1988. And I think since then they have adopted the ISO standard until today. Okay. So, so you must remember 17025 is a generic standard. All right. So every country, every and that, accreditation system try to interpret the standard with their own guidelines for implementation. So Singlas also got a long list of uh, documents for you to take a look. And the, all those documents is an extension, are uh, the extension of 17025 standard uh, by the local guidelines. So you may want to download this uh, uh, you may go to the uh, to their website and uh, all the documents are free for downloading. So 17.025 is all about uh, what are the contents. The contents are very general, scope, normative, uh, the reference, terms, definition, general, structure, and so on. In fact, if you were to read any other ISO standards, not only 17025, you'll see that actually the title of each clauses are the same, all the same. That is why there is a purpose of standardization. Okay, so 17025 has different content from ISO 9000, but the title of each clause are exactly the same. Okay? So in uh, 17025, we have another two appendixes. Annex A, Annex B for meteorological and management system, informative, and then the references. Okay. So, so I'd like to, to highlight the important elements in the ISO 17025 and show you how they are related to laboratory quality and to the laboratory productivity. Okay, start from the clause, uh, earlier clauses are not, not that, uh, uh, not that uh, important to, to, to draw your attention. That's what we discuss, start from clause five and clause six. So the 17025 wants to make sure the laboratory, it has a legal entity, or if not, it must be a part of the legal entity. So the laboratory must have a proper organizational structure with a proper uh, organization chart. And also, they also require that the laboratory personnel must be having certain level of competence and those will be assessed or will be audited through the documented qualification and training records. And definitely, they also require the lab must have a proper, suitable facility, appropriate facility and suitable environment for that particular kind of work that you are doing. Okay. And definitely, you must have a proper equipment and also you must have a way to ensure that the suppliers or your service providers are up to certain standards. In fact, the standard is ISO certified or accredited. So this is one of 
the very first kind of requirement under 17025. Then under the clause seven, then they have a series of the requirements to ensure the laboratory quality. Okay, how to, do, how to ensure? First, they talk about the test method must be properly selected and must be verified. It encourages the use of standard method, standardized test method for better inter-laboratory comparison. Secondly, they also stress that if you were to do any in-house method, uh, in-house developed method, then you must have done a proper validation. It must be thoroughly validated before you put them to use. And uh, technical assessor are very particular about in-house method. If you ask for accreditation and wanted to use an in-house method, you better be prepared to, to make a proper method validation report for their inspection, okay, for their assessment. Uh, another subject raised in the clause seven is sampling and sampling uncertainty. Why? Because ISO recognizes the importance of sampling prior to laboratory analysis. No matter how good is your laboratory analysis, if the samples are not representative of the population, of the bulk cargo of the consignment, then it is just a waste of time to do laboratory analysis. So 7025 has put this as a requirement, and in fact has put it as one of the laboratory activities, sampling. So the lab must doing the sampling must have a proper sampling plan, must have a proper sampling method with statistical consideration. And on top of that, your sampling, you must also determine or estimate your sampling uncertainty, okay? So without sampling uncertainty, then we have to talk about measurement uncertainty. So under clause 7.6, it is very uh, important uh, in fact, it is one of the must uh, so-called assess item when you are subject for audit, when you are subjected for uh, independent assessment by SAC stained glass. Why? Measurement uncertainty will give a measure of confidence or credibility for the result that you report. And also it will be able to be used to interpret the results again specification or against the uh, regulatory tolerance limit with more confidence. So to some of you, you may wonder what is the meaning of measurement uncertainty? Well, measurement uncertainty basically means that if you were to give a result with your estimated uncertainty, plus and minus, so you are telling your customer that the true value the true value is within x minus u to x plus u. The true value, but exactly where? What is your exact value? I won't know. But I can be very uh, confident to tell you, or rather I'm 95% confident to tell you that the actual value that you're looking for is within the range x minus u to x plus u. Okay, for example, if you have a result 10% plus minus 1%, then I'm telling my customer the true value is between 9% and 11%. And I'm 95% confident. So there are methods to, to estimate measurement uncertainty, okay? Then clause 7.7 .7 is the title is called ensuring the validity of results. Now, this is actually is a very important clause. It is a core of technical competence. It has given you guidelines, guidance to implement regular intra. Intra means within laboratory and inter, inter laboratory quality control monitoring procedures. Okay, so it gives a long list of uh, ways that you can do within your lab and between labs to 
to ensure your test results are valid, meaning your test results are okay, your test results are accurate enough to be acceptable by your customer. And of course, under the 7.7, .7, there is also stated that you must participate in PT program, proficiency testing program, because successful uh, PT results will raise your reliability of your test result. Why? Because if you are successful in the PT program, meaning your report, your results are comparable with 95% of the participants. Don't you think that is a good confidence? Yeah. Then, there is another, uh, this is a new clause in uh, 17.025.2017 revision. Uh, it has stated that you must be able to apply decision rule when you report statements of conformity. What is the statement of conformity? There are times that again, your customer asks you to analyze a certain analyte in a sample, and he say, my specification is 10% maximum. What is the result in the sample? So you have to carry out your testing. Should your result is 10.0, would you tell the customer it is on spec or not? That is what you call, you make a statement of conformity to your customer. Now, if you were to have a test result of 10.0%, when the customer say, my specification is 10% maximum, cannot be more than 10%. Now, if you were to be to be very confident to tell customer 10.0 is a pass, means you say conform to the spec, conform with the specification, uh, then you must think about what is the risk if you make that wrong decision. You make a wrong decision. Can you make a wrong decision when you have a 10% uh, specification and your result is 10.0? Yeah. Why? Because your 10.0 has uncertainty. 10.0 can be 11 or 9, for example. Okay, So in that case, you are having a 50% chance by somebody at another lab to have a test result that is outside 10 and below 11. So you are exposing a 50% risk if you were to say 10.0 is a pass. Uh, that is what the question on decision rule. But of course, some of the laboratory, they say, I take 10.0 as a pass. I'm prepared to take a risk. Well, thank you. <laughs> that, is your, that is your decision. That is your decision. But to be proper in a normal uh, so-called uh, uh, routine of work, we want to control this particular risk, the risk of making a wrong decision, okay? So this is something that we must always bear in mind because our test result always got uncertainty in the measurement. And another one, your test is done on the sample, but how representative is this sample to the population? Is a sample that you tested has similar constituent distribution like the population or not? The chances is, the answer is always not sure. We may, may or may not be. So in that case, we have uncertainty of sampling into our consideration as well. So you see, so that is a very important clause, uh, particularly in the new standard. So decision is to be made for non-compliance or rejection of test result with low risk of false rejection. Meaning that we try to control our risk for telling the customer fail the specification when it is a pass. So that is the decision rule that we are talking about. So having gone through the clause seven, which is supposed to be the main bulk of improving laboratory quality, then there is a clause eight, management system requirement, that is talking about, uh, the, this clause is talking about your management uh, issues, how to be productive 
in your laboratory management. Okay. So this is to raise the productivity in laboratory quality management system. And what are the requirements? These are the whole list of requirements, 8.2 to 8.9. We are referring to that your management system must be documented. No point to say I have done this, I have done that and so on. We always want to see evidence. We want to see documentation. So whatever system that you have, it must be all well documented. Started from your quality uh, manual, from the, uh, from the quality procedure, from your standard uh, SOP, on your document of your method, and even standard forms that you use for your routine recording and so on and so forth. So you must have a proper management system documentation. Then you must also be able to show that you are able to control all this documentation and also control your records. Okay. Now, if there are any risks, you must be able to show you can do a risk assessment and that can create opportunity for you. And of course, in your routine testing, you must be also looking for improvement, right? So improvement is improving to make a better productive productivity, for example. Then if there are any complaints or anything that are not right, you must have a way to do corrective action. And then at the end of the day, the laboratory must do your own internal audit, okay? You don't wait until once a year for single last uh, assessor to come and audit you. That might be too late. So you must be able to have a system to carry out your internal audit. Right? And lastly, but not least, is your management. Your top management must be at least attend a management review meeting once a year to take a review of the whole year's operation and look for various ways to improve the system, looking at various ways to, to increase the, the technical capability by, by improving, uh, buying new equipment, new facility, expansion of your laboratory, so on and so forth. So you see the cross A covers practically uh, all the laboratory operations from the management point of view. And this, if all this can be well complied with, then your productivity should be increased. So you can see 17025 is a standard that is helping laboratory to, to make confidence in your laboratory quality as well as to increase your productivity. Okay. So in a conclusion, I will just to sum up to say there are really benefits to implement the 17025 standard requirement through accreditation by an independent body such as King Glass in Singapore. And if you are in Malaysia, it will be SAM in Malaysia, Thailand will be PILA and so on and so forth. Okay, so in addition to get the credibility of your report with the data user, your end user, you are actually also helping to lift the technical technical trade barrier for not uh, for for the that for that uh, what they call for not to for you not to retest if your accreditation, uh, your, if your laboratory endorse report is also recognized by the MRA partners, MRA signatories over the other country. So this is actually is a good way to overcome technical barrier, uh, particularly in the trade. Okay. But of course, to, to, to really do a proper uh, accreditation work in your laboratory, you must have a good team effort, okay? So keeping a sound laboratory management system under this ISO system calls for a good team 
happen. happen. So that is all I have for today. And I will be glad to answer any questions uh, at the end of this uh, webinar. Okay, uh, doctor. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Rao. So it was a wonderful uh, lecture. So yeah, so once again, I, I request all uh, participants, okay, so the, you to type your questions, either in the everyone comment to all, or you can you can chat actually put the chat box into like just to me. So later on, we will consolidate and and go through this Q and A, okay. Okay, now we move on to the next one. So that will be done by me. So please give me a time. So let me share my screen. I hope you are able to see my screen and I'm uh, audible enough for everybody. Yeah, I can see. Hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, so again, so we are going to like uh, look how the proficiency testing results and also not daily. So any internal quality control data, how we are using this data to improve quality in lab operation. So during Mr. Rao's presentation at the beginning, he was trying to emphasize on one thing, you know, like your lab may be uh, producing test results, but it's not like sure that whether this is correct or not. So the only way you can do it only through a kind of a comparative check by independent third party. And this is where the proficiency test, uh, actually testing is coming in place or Similarly, the interlaboratory comparison. So the PT or the interlaboratory is really heart of this, uh, the entire uh, quality management system. Even for singlers, it's really helping God to make their uh, assessment and judgment better. So I also want to like uh, give some kind of insight on the quality aspect from a testing laboratory versus a, a production lab. Okay. So if you are talking about the QC lab in a production uh, factory or okay, as an industry, where let's say you are, you are you, a company is making a hydrochloric acid. So they have a, a documented procedure to procure the uh, raw material with a certain uh, kind of specification and they know how this has to be made. So as a QC lab, so they will receive the final product, okay? And this final product will be tested and it has to meet in terms of the strength of the acid or the color and so on and so forth. And so once this is tested and they know the results, then only it reach out to the customer, okay? So here, little easy, you know, you know what you are testing and you have your own guidelines, so whether this is passing the QC or not. But if you look at the situation in a testing lab, because the testing lab also a kind of production uh, factory, you can say, because every test report that comes out of a lab is a product. But the unfortunate thing is every product can be a uh, different, you know, because if you're uh, a hydrochloric acid manufacturing plant, I means their product is same, only the concentration can go a bit here and there. But in a testing lab, you may be testing for trace elements, you may be testing for organic contaminants, you, can, you may be testing for TOC, and you may be doing some calibration. So it is every time different thing. And your final product, you do not know whether this is the correct one. This is where you have to have some kind of a, a parallel quality uh, assurance a scheme, and that will allow you to have some kind of confidence on things that you are doing it correct okay so the internal quality control check and the participation in this proficiency test and interlaboratory comparison are key elements in in maintaining uh, quality in the laboratory operation and it also gives the level of uh, confidence that, that the organization and staff require so when they are doing this on a day-to-day -day basis okay so having said that so this is what 
the, the statement is a regular okay, internal and independent external assessment of the technical performance of a laboratory is necessary to assure the validity of measurements of tests and it should be part of the overall quality strategy okay so within that there are two ways that uh, people are uh, doing it or it's required to do it one is the participation in external quality assurance scheme something like a proficiency test or in laboratory comparison study because in the absence of suitable uh, proficiency testing scheme, one has to choose enter laboratory comparison. Okay, so if you look at this, this is almost similar to a kind of a singlet audit, you know, it's like an offsite audit. So if you are able to demonstrate your competency with this one study, so that tells you about your entire quality system. It's not about just that result. And this is not reflecting that's just that particular result, it is reflecting the quality management system of the entire laboratory. Similarly, maybe it's one person doing this test, but the result outcome is reflecting the entire quality management system of the organization. So the person who is carrying out this PT is representing his or her organization. So that's a kind of a, a responsibility uh, is on that person's shoulder. So it's really key to do this correctly and so that's the person who is doing gain the confidence and the organization who is who has implemented such a quality management system is also confident to see that okay we are able to perform as per the requirement so the pt really uh, playing an important role to demonstrate your your competency through a third party assessment okay so but this is one time you know so we have like three, six, five days, and sometimes some lab is uh, running three shifts. So, so one test or one test parameter does not guarantee that you do everything correct on every day. Okay, so that's why the internal quality assurance or the internal quality control checks are very critical as well. And these two combination only will help even the uh, accreditation body to do their job nicely. So within the internal quality assurance or the internal quality control check, there are different way people, uh, can, it can be done. So either by using a reference material or sometime on and off you use a kind of, uh, if you have that kind of uh, luxury to have different analytical technique for one particular analysis. And the most important thing is you may be collecting a lot of data if you do not have a control chart to see what this data really telling us and are we able to make use of that information to improve or just to maintain for either case. So it should not be a case, you know, like you do a QC check and this data is lying there and somebody just endorsing after 10 days, one month, that's it. Even because the, the person who is doing this every day before starting his actual sample will not have any kind of motivation. So it would be good for the quality manager to present this data once in a while. Okay, this is the QC data. I have got it for this uh, performance check for the analytical balance. And this is how our data is really scattered. And this is good or bad. Then that tells how good your laboratory, laboratory uh, environment is, okay, if there are humidity changes or airflow changes, then this all can affect the stability of the analytical balance. So this is important, you know, like this is what I'm trying to emphasize during my presentation. We may have a lot of information available. Are we using it for a purpose? That is what we really have to see. It, okay. So among the internal quality control check, the replicate test and blind duplicates is something very useful on, you know, because most of the time, the person who is carrying out the analysis, if he knows, okay, he's doing something uh, special, special, excuse me, then definitely he will also try to be more careful. But are we giving similar attention to every sample that we do? If not so, even the QC sample should be uh, seen as a normal sample. Then are we able to demonstrate similar kind of output? That is what really matters, okay? 
So the intermediate checks on the measuring equipment, that is something already is, 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 is a requirement even from the singlers also, we'll talk about it later. Okay, so we will have the first off of the session where we will talk about the, P, uh, the PT side, then we will talk about the internal quality control check. So before going to the PT part, I just want to give a couple of uh, quick example where how the quality really uh, stands on different aspect. Okay, let's, uh, okay, quality in terms of the definition, you know, like conformance to uh, requirements or specification. So in this case, this specification is defined by, you know, because that is actually under this your accreditation schedule. So where you were saying, okay, I can perform hardness tests by this standard method with this level of uncertainty. Okay, this is what you are telling. And the third party or the single class is really uh, accrediting that particular test based on the evidence what they can see. Okay, so this, specification refer to the test method that you can offer to the customer. So when you refer to any standard method, so based on the standard requirement, okay, particularly for this, this is an example only. So where they only they talk about the, this method should be able to perform a 0.8% of relative standard deviation, which is more of a standard uncertainty. So your laboratory uh, um, measurement uncertainty should be somewhere around this or slightly higher, okay? So that is a kind of guideline. So this is your specification. Now let's say you get a sample from a customer, okay, for hardness analysis from a tap water. And this person basically, okay, they, they don't know much detail. So even they do not like tell you, okay, which technique to use, whether the titration or ICP. And if you are, doing with this uh, kind of titration method, okay, they are expecting just to pass the uh, criteria based on the hardness, but you end up seeing a very high result, okay. So the customer is not happy. So definitely you will complain, okay, this value is very high. So the first approach that we do, we may do a re repeat analysis and repeat analysis also can give a similar results. Then we only try to look at our QC data, okay. And if your QC data also showing everything correct, but still the problem is not solved. This is where one may have to consider an alternate technique. Okay, for hardness, you can consider ICP. Okay, so when you do with the ICP, then you end up seeing the results are really a lower side. The possible reason for this uh, uh, variation could be because this titration method can have an interference if the water has other trace elements because the EDTA can consume by other trace elements also. So that may be a reason why you found high value okay, with the titration method versus ICP method. So when you have this kind of sample coming to your lab, even selecting the right method also is a part of the quality system, you know. Either you have to ask the customer, okay, this water will have other trace elements or because sometimes ICP may be slightly expensive. So even customer also may prefer, okay, you do it by titration. But for certain type of samples, this titration method, method may not be suitable. Okay. So this is also kind of uh, falling under the requirement of your quality system, you know, just to recommend the right method and choose the right method for the customer. So this is what exactly is the quality. So if you do it correctly, you don't have to repeat. Okay, that means you save time, you save cost, then you can do more number of samples. This is how it is. So another example, okay. So if you talk about a temperature calibration, okay. I'm a testing lab, I'm giving a thermometer for calibration, okay, two point calibration, this range. So you have some kind of data like this, you know, this is your you want to have a calibration at 40 degree and this is what it is measured with this level of uncertainty. And so first, when you receive this calibration report, you have to see whether this uh, uncertainty is something acceptable for our uh, usage, or even if you are doing any, any temperature measurement for the water or other things, you have to, so basically you have to evaluate this. Then the second thing, what you have to do is, this data, you got it from a calibration lab. So calibration lab you have used a reference thermometer. So since they are a calibration lab, their uncertainty 
should be much lower than this, at least one tenth or at least like one third. So that is how you are able to judge whether the results coming from a calibration lab is uh, good and acceptable. Similarly, as a calibration lab, uh, like a test provider, you have to demonstrate your competency by showing, showing a good uncertainty for your reference uh, thermometer compared to the one that you are calibrating for the customer. Okay? So these are some of the things when it comes to the quality. You know, One is the output. You look at this, how, what information you are getting and how this is being evaluated. And second is even at the starting stage of your test, you know, like you have to ensure that you are choosing the right method for the right type of sample. Okay, so yeah, again, just have to uh, re-emphasize the quality helps to provide uh, accurate and reliable test results. And the most important uh, thing is consistently, okay? It is not one time, so that is important. So when you are able to give such a, a reliable results uh, on a consistent basis, so your lab gain some kind of reputation, so credentials or credibility. And because you are doing it correctly every time, you do not need to repeat few times or many times. That means you have resource available to do more samples. So it helps you to increase your productivity. So improving quality means increasing credibility. That means more people come to you, you can do more samples. So obviously it will lead to a, a good profit, profitability. Okay, now let us see how this proficiency test and internal uh, QAQC helps improving uh, quality of a lab operation. Okay, so that the, the, the point here, if you are able to improve your quality, then obviously it is helping for your business and credibility and profitability. So that's really uh, something is a well understood statement. Okay, now uh, let's uh, see why uh, proficiency testing exercise are important. As we said before, it is important to demonstrate, okay, the laboratory technical competency through external independent assessment okay, to assure validity of measurement tests offered by a laboratory. Again, because every sample is different every test report is different you cannot do any qc within the sample so you have to use something like an external source like an internal quality control check or a pt to really evaluate okay your laboratory competency and staff competency and this is as i said before something similar to singlas audit because in singlas audit, they are looking at the entire uh, quality management system, starting from the management requirements and technical requirements and documentation and so on and so forth. But as a PT scheme, you are only like focusing on one thing, but the outcome of that reflecting of your entire quality management system. So that is how that the importance of PT. And even this is uh, important for the accreditation bodies and auditors also during the entire assessment because they may have seen your quality documentation and also the training records, instrument calibration, everything is good. But if you do not show the PT, then probably it becomes a kind of major NC. So even to complete or fulfill the requirement of a single audit, the proficiency test is an important. Okay. But at the same time, we need to understand as a, a testing lab, we are doing this, taking part in this proficiency test not to fulfill the requirement of singlas, okay? It is actually for the benefit of the participating lab, means the lab who is offering test service is able to gain confidence on their service by taking part in the PT. Okay, at the same time, this data is used for accreditation body or regulatory bodies, even sometimes because if somebody is uh, subcontracting certain number of analysis to a lab, they may want to really look at your PT schemes uh, data, you know. So, 
but the thing is we need to understand i am taking part in this proficiency test exercise for my own benefit okay and which is being used by singlas and other regulatory authorities so the moment you take this point very clear automatically you pay more attention to this because anything you do for somebody maybe it's only for the sake of fulfillment but if it is for your own organization and for your own uh, uh, kind of credibility then definitely we we, we take a little more uh, seriousness on this so that is very important point to understand when we are taking part in proficiency testing okay so the purpose of proficiency test it is not about passing or failing okay definitely singlers want to see a, a, a kind of qualified pt but it is not critical or uh, mandatory okay so as a organization as a testing lab you are participating okay just to gain confidence on your own laboratory management quality management system also trying to learn from the results because you don't have to only look at the z square you know all the en square even even look at the entire data set and see what other information it's giving and how that can be used for our uh, laboratory uh, improvement okay so the goal is definitely to have a good performance okay in a pt not only single time uh, regularly so good performance consistently at the same time one need not to go panic okay if you fail one time does not mean that your lab is bad similarly if you pass one time does not make you like oh your laboratory excuse me laboratory is uh, good forever okay it can be either way okay fail or pass that is only one indication the most important thing is study the entire report and get the information and get the lessons learned so that can be uh, implemented into your laboratory operation okay so the goals are in in a different aspect okay first and the most important one is we want to see how accurate our data is so that means you want to perform like our performance against the the pt provider reference value or sign value okay at that particular time because you have short term and long term uh, benefit so when i am taking part in one pt scheme first i want to say how did i perform in this okay the moment you say it is good that's a good sign then you dig into that further and see how this was compared Uh, comparable to last year data okay or the previous year's data whether this is showing upward trend or downward trend all this can be analyzed okay so this is what the second point is compare the performance over a period okay so you have to look at that means you need to have a kind of strategy where because singlas may be telling okay you have to have at least one pt for each of your test within this three year cycle but sometime you should consider beyond that okay because it will help you a lot to look at your uh, lab performance okay so that's why because if you have one or two data even making any kind of statistical analysis is going to be a difficult one so you have to consider a kind of regular participation okay but yeah the the frequencies depending upon your budget allocated for such things also the availability of excuse me availability of pt schemes for a certain specific type of test okay then the third thing what you wanted to see is compare the performance with other laboratories at a particular time so that means some of the other laboratory offering similar service okay or even the the expert laboratory because the report may have a different uh, kind of categories you know how the group of lab has done it in different way so you can see in which group you are really falling in and how this can be improved further and what is the lesson we learn from this okay and the another point 
okay we don't have to hide anything okay at least as i said in singlas if they see your one of the pt is failed they cannot really like fail you from offering service the immediate thing what they want to see is what is your corrective action and what is your preventive action so mistakes can occur or we're learning from it so this is what you have to document so you don't have to hide the reality but you have to address it immediately with a corrective action and subsequently a kind of preventive action to ensure that it is not happening again okay so at the end of the day we want to see is the pt scheme doing its job for improving the quality of chemical measurements so this is what finally we are trying to uh, drive you know so rest of the things are like just to complement but the main thing is we want to keep up our uh, good quality okay for testing so that we can offer good, good service to our customers so how we evaluate this pt data in two different way one is first the pt scheme whenever you sign up for any pt scheme you know like they may be explaining how the assigned value is established and some people you know some of the pt provider they try to keep this acceptable range a bit wider you know like 10% 15% so in such situation you will see that everybody is passing you know certain type of uh, test require a low uncertainty okay? like 2% or 5% for such test if you are choosing a pt scheme with a wider acceptable range you may pass the pt but you may have problem with your own quality okay so this is the information we have to look how the assign values like establish in a pt scheme and usually what is their target uncertainty because the pt provider should have this as part of their pt scheme up front you know the exact value will be known later but they will say okay we are providing a pt scheme where that assign value will be in this range and our targeted uncertainty will be of this range okay so that will allow you to choose the right pt for you then another information from this announcement you have to see how is their sample prepared okay whether are they making something like a formulation sample or is it something a certified reference material or do they have some kind of reference value coming from an experts lab or even it can be a really a kind of lab made sample and that the value can be assigned based on group of expert laboratories or participants so every single thing can really play a kind of part to have a different assigned value so when your assigned value is different and the range is different then the outcome of that also can be different as i said if you have a wide range you will see happily okay we have passed but you may still have a lot of problem in your lab that repeat analysis because some of the uh, test uh, reports are not acceptable acceptable by the customers so that's why the pt will not tell you the entire story of your lab performance but the point here is you have to choose the right pt scheme so looking at the information how the assign value is done and what is the kind of uncertainty this pt scheme can provide for us and this is what basically you will use for the uh, data interpretation data analysis and interpretation okay okay so under this determination of assigned value the formulation how it is done they take a kind of matrix if it is a water sample or if it is a sediment they have a sample like a matrix then they spike with the concentration of analyte okay Uh, from your reference material then they do the homogenization and they confirm the homogeneity then they do the bottling and they do the homogeneity within the bottle and homogeneity between the bottle because both are important because every participant of a pt uh, uh, will get a different bottle so it is important there is a 
kind of homogeneity be between the bottle. Similarly, every lab will take few helicots from one bottle. So if few helicots give different value, then it is a problem because then there are cases where the PT scheme was not able to successfully complete, you know, because the homogeneity was not established properly or the stability was not established properly. Parallelly, they had already started the scheme. By the time they receive all these results, the stability was not good. So you have results all over. So as a PT provider, that is a kind of requirement, you know, you have to show a successful uh, PT uh, exercise also. That means if you are not done that, then you have not done your due diligence. So that is, that's why we have this accreditation scheme for the PT provider under which there are certain requirements to fulfill. So the formulation means they have to ensure the homogeneity. So this is something we don't have to worry, okay? But when you are choosing a PT scheme, you have to see the historical uh, track record of this PT provider so that we are not wasting our time also. And because we want to have a good PT data for our uh, quality system. So it's important you choose the right one, okay? So some PT provider, they may buy a certified reference material and they use it. But then you may find this kind of exercise are a bit expensive because the reference material is not cheaper and they have to make different bottles and they have to again check the homogeneity between the bottles. So cost of such PT scheme may be very high. And the third one is generally a reference value coming from some, sometimes they use an expert lab, group of experts lab, or even they can work with a metrology lab or chemical metrology lab. So one thing what we have to uh, basically look whenever you participate in a PT, the, the uncertainty associated okay, from your laboratory okay, should be generally on higher side. And the one PT provider should be much lower. Okay, so that is what. So if you are saying you have done a PT sample and your uncertainty is 3%, so the PT provider also establish uncertainty that should be at least 1% or less. Because when you are taking part of your PT scheme, you are seeing the PT provider as an expert. Okay? That means they should do better job than what every other lab is doing. And how you can assess this only by their uh, measurement uncertainty. So the PT scheme and PT provider uncertainty should be always much lower than the participant uncertainty. But this is something you can always look in the past also whenever you are signing for the future PT schemes. Okay, this is again, as a PT uh, participant, you may not to know too much about this, but this information will be helpful to choose the right PT scheme for you. So when you are talking about consensus value, consensus value can be done by or established by three different approach. So here, okay, this is all the data supplied, like uh, submitted by all different lab, okay? Here, you can come up with the assigned value based by using a group of expert laboratory. So that means, the expert laboratory has to fulfill certain requirement. Okay, so that is a responsibility of the PT provider. We don't have to see that. But for us, this is most preferred approach. Okay, that means if some of, otherwise, when you have all participants included, some of the participants, if they are not doing correct, it may affect everybody because your range may become wider. So everybody will see that we are past, we are past. But sometimes, uh, you may be at the border also. So that's why if you are choosing, if the PT provider is providing the assigned value through uh, expert lab, this is the best one to consider. Okay. Then the second one is, you know, people try to do a kind of uh, statistical uh, analysis to derive the consensus value where they try to run the outlier test because the outlier test sometimes is very subjective, you know. And you have to do, a, it is an iterative process. You have to continuously do it to extend that you are able to remove as many as outliers possible. But 
at the same time, statistically, sometimes it is not recommended also. It's always a kind of challenge to balance between the two. So most of the uh, PT provider, they go by this uh, non-parametric approach. That means you don't have to remove any outlier. Okay, outlier test is not required. So you just go by the median. So because the median can really have a better statistical uh, data for a mean value compared to the arithmetic mean. So if you are using the participant data, okay, for assigning a value, the median, the non-parametric approach is better than this one, okay? But as a participant, if you are given a choice to choose between these two, this is the best one to give you the best result for your, your laboratory uh, assessment. Okay, so the next thing is uh, the range, you know, because the Z square or the EN square is based on the range. The range is nothing but the uncertainty on the lower and higher end. Okay, so here, even the PT provider has to demonstrate, okay, it is fit for the purpose. So as a participating lab, you also have to gather or observe or collect this information. So whenever there is a PT announcement comes, okay, or if it is available somewhere, you read through this information, okay, what is their target uncertainty? And you try to choose something, okay, that is fit for your purpose. Otherwise, it is not really very useful, okay? And generally, you all know because your uh, uncertainty can go wider, okay? When you have a lower uh, concentration, because if you are doing percentage level analysis, generally your uncertainty can be almost 0 0.1 or, or less than 1% in general. But as you go to PPP level, it can go to 10%, 15% and more, okay? So this is a general guideline, okay? So you expect to, have such a different uncertainty. That means uh, you should not look for a PT scheme where I want to see a 5% uncertainty for PPP level analysis. PPP level, definitely it can go to 10 to 20%, okay, unless it is a meteorological level reference standard where it can be a bit lower, okay? So otherwise people try to go for this precision experiment where you have to do continuously repeated analysis and they have to ensure that you get only 5% of your results are non-conforming. That means 95% of the results should fall within the range that you are setting it, okay? So the first one is about the assigned value. So this is about the range or the standard deviation or the uncertainty, okay? So the Z square value is calculated, calculated based on these two information. Okay, so now, so when you have these PT uh, results come out, okay, the immediately every participating lab will look at into the assigned value, okay, so that you know where your data lies. Then statistically that has to be evaluated also, because let's say I have participated in a hardness, so where the assigned value is 100, and we have reported 90 or 95 ppm. So first we can have a kind of satisfaction. Okay, our value is not too high, like far away from the assigned value. Then the statistical evaluation data will tell you further, okay, you are, your value is acceptable or warning or unsatisfactory. So this is done by three or four different approaches. But most common one is the Z square and EN, EN square. But they're all like interrelative. So if they are giving Z score, you can always do the bias difference or percentage difference by yourself or other way around also, okay? But generally, most of the PT scheme, they will provide Z score or EN scores, okay? So here is based on the uh, bias. So bias is basically, this is, your lab value and this is the assigned value, okay? Then you just have the division of this, okay? That's the assigned value. So that will tell you, okay, 
like your deviation is 5% or 10% or 20% or more. So this graph is basically showing that these are all different data. And this is what the deviation from the assigned value. This is a chromium analysis, okay, by this neutron activation analysis. Uh, so you can see this particular lab, they are almost like 60% lower than the assigned value. And this, and for well, except to one, everybody has shown a kind of uh, downtrend, you know, like in the negative side. So this is also th something you have to look at your lab data, you know, on a uh, regular for short term and long term, how you are seeing, because sometimes you may end up seeing a higher value or lower value because of matrix effect, okay, false positive, false negative side. So you have to see how you are performing in terms of this variation also. And mostly you do not want to see one, one side trend, you know, like if you repeat, there should be some positive deviation, there should be some negative deviation. That is when you can see that you do not have any kind of a systematic error. So this variation can be only coming from the random error. So here, so you can see when the bias is like large, your TN square also definitely higher than one, so you fail. So in this case, you can see only these two results, okay? So they have 10% and 13% deviation in terms of the bias from the assigned value. So, but the range is in a way that these two results can pass, you know. And this is a warning and anything about two is considered a kind of uh, unsatisfactory. That means they have to look back their entire validation again. Okay, this is based on the bias. And, and this is the Z-score. The Z score generally uh, you have your lab data and this is the assigned value and this is uncertainty. Okay. Some people use combined uncertainty or sometimes they use the standard deviation or the standard uncertainty. Okay. Here this is the indicator. So if you want to pass your Z score value should be two or less. Okay. And if you are falling between two and three, is questionable, but still not really a yeah, big problem. But when your Z-score is higher than three, then it is really a problem. Okay, you can see in this particular uh, data, that's only one data that is uh, out, all others. So here, what I wanted to emphasize, because sometimes when your laboratory is taking part in this kind of PT scheme, I'm not sure how much information is distributed to the working staff because I also recall my old time. So as a staff, you get a sample, you analyze and give it to the quality manager and quality manager do everything. But the thing is, if it is not kind of a feedback to the person who is working or the other people who are working similar tests, sometimes the purpose is not fully really solved. Okay, so that is something that we have to encourage that you let the entire lab staff or at least the group of people who are doing similar tests should be informed about the outcome of PT and also the kind of some inputs or guidance, how things can be done better and so on and so forth. So the information dissemination is very important in a lab to keep the quality system good. Okay, okay this is another way of calculation. So that is EN square, as I said, EN square generally uh, most common and z-score is another uh, mostly they will report both also okay z-score because they are getting a little more uh, stringent you know like you have your 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 denominator added up with two things you know like the z-score only one uncertainty here the uncertainty from the participant lab and that's an uncertainty from the uh, pt provider so if your uncertainty is very high so you it will affect your en score you know like you have bigger number coming here, okay? So sometime, okay, the difference is high, it's okay, if it is small sometime, you have to ensure that just because of your uncertainty, it should not affect your EN square. So they, the reason why they are calculating the EN square, it is not about only getting the 
one one report because this report is not just one data you know it is coming from three or six data so your uncertainty is also a reflection of your laboratory quality system so that's why the organizer they like to consider including your your uh, include your uh, uncertainty into the calculation and this can be a very good indicator for you to look at your performance okay eta score also something similar okay so here instead of combined uncertainty you are using the standard uncertainty standard uncertainty so you do not have the the coverage factor is not included so, so that's the only difference so but this is not very common mostly people use only the en square and even your laboratory has to consider this as a, a better indicator than the z square as i said because your lab uncertainty is included in the calculation that is a very good indication to see how your lab is performing okay so that is how the first set of information you have to collect so what is assigned value and what is like uh, what is the comparison between the assigned value and our lab value and how how does it uh, reflect on the z square and en square so that is what basically the kind of interpretation of uh, results. So participating in the PT scheme, okay, of limited value, unless, okay, this is what I'm just telling. So you have to take advantage of its performance evaluation and collect or absorb the information as much as possible from the PT scheme report and transfer that to a laboratory, okay? So that is what, so definitely this is something we will not, uh omit because everybody but this is something they give upfront you know as a kind of summary for each participant they will have a summary report okay this is assigned value and this is your value and your this is your z score and en score so sometimes some lab they just see only the first bit they don't even report look at the entire report but it's good you the quality manager try to read the entire report and gather information and pass on to the staff who are working on this type of analysis. Okay. And yeah, then you have to do some this kind of uh, higher or lower than the consensus or the assigned value. Okay. And you have to have your own internal acceptance criteria. As I said, some PT scheme, they may have a wider acceptable range, but if you are confident on your quality system and our lab can produce within 5% uncertainty, but the PT provider is giving a 10% one. So you can see that, okay, I want to achieve within 5% did be achieved. So that's something that you can have your own. It's not a requirement, but as I said, anything you do from your PT report and learn from it and implement is always uh, such a benefit for your laboratory. So this, Trend performance generally done graphically or even normal Excel sheet. Okay. So you have to look at the data from a single PT perspective and also the longer period. You know, you can have a historogram or bar charts or even the normal probability. Okay. But here, some of this can be applicable only when you have multiple data points. You know, like if it is one data and one test, you, do, you can only go by this bar plots you know so this is what you will see something like you know like instead of three samples if it is only one sample you can have such comparison uh, for the assigned value and your value and you put the uncertainty for the pt sample and your lab one so that will give some kind of reflection you know how we are performing and this is another way of presenting the graph okay this is the she what control chart so where you have to ensure that your en score is within one okay so because instead of looking at 10 or 20 data points separately you put all these together and graphically present so it, people can easily observe okay instead of looking at one by one separately they see the graphical illustration they can understand all our 20 samples or 10 samples or six elements in three different samples, they're all good. So here, except one sample, they're all good. So this is something the QA manager has to uh, do it, you know, and not only do it, and it's not only for the singular auditor, you know, you have to share this 
to your lab staff. So the QA manager has to do some kind of uh, meeting once in a while and give this kind of even the internal quality data, whatever they are collecting and give, you give some kind of feedback so that they also feel satisfied that their work is used somewhere. Otherwise, it may be felt that they are doing it just for the sake of fulfillment. So that should not be there. But then the motivation is really uh, going down. You know? So you have the QM manager really have to give some kind of motivation factor to keep up the kind of uh, energy within the staff for doing all this uh, quality related work. Okay, so this is again another set of data. So where you can see the downtrend. So somebody is not good at this uh, calcium at the early days, but as they proceed, so they were able to improve. Some you can see they were good, then they started going down. So there are different reasons why this is happening. And this is something we have to see. So in the laboratory, even the quality manager has to have some kind of understanding about their staffs, you know, in terms of their competency. And as the quality manager, like monitor the lab data regularly, they should be able to even make some judgment. Okay, this staff can have problem. This is or her strength and this is her weakness. So accordingly, you can consider some kind of training with other staff and so on and so forth. So definitely it's, it's important that the quality manager do some extra uh, job or work to really keep up the things uh, more kind of encouraging for everybody in the lab, okay? So when you see unsat unsat excuse me, unsatisfactory results, so it can be just because the raw data or something is not like captured properly, or it can be the entire some sample preparation to the until reporting, or it can be a, a different like successive PT studies where first time you pass, second time you fail. Okay, it can be of different things. Okay, but most importantly, what is the typical uh, possibilities? Okay, technical problem. Technical problem is again is very broader, so it can be the method side, or the instrument side, or the person side. So this is what later on listed down separately also. So storage, sometimes you receive a PT sample and you know this is required to like complete only in six months. So during these six months, have you kept your sample properly safely? So that's important also. So the method validity, you have to see whether the, it is deteriorating because of certain reason, okay, equipment change, or standards change or the reagents purity or anything of that nature. So either you look at this individually and see which is the one really contributing to this uh, unsatisfactory results. Then based on that, you fix this problem and also ensure that such things are not recurring in the future. Okay, so I'm uh, running a bit uh, over time, so I have to uh, speed up a bit. Okay, mm, this PT, okay, so this is a kind of uh, uh, go, no go kind of uh, diagram you can see. Is my PT result okay? Yeah, if it is okay, then are we doing it every time okay? Yes, then you don't have to worry much, but you still have to be stay alert and watchful. But if it is no, so was it a problem only this time or even like last time? Because cannot be last time also, because last time means this time you should get it correct, okay? So, so the answer should be yes for the last time it was okay only this time so no problem you can fix it could be some kind of uh, transcription error or calibration standard or the reagent purity or the lab or staff changes which can is a short term problem long term problem definitely it can be equipment that is old and slowly is deteriorating so the method validation was done to five years ago or ten years ago then you have problems and some of the staff or change. So they did not really pick up the competency. So you will find these things here in short term and long term, some of the things are common. So this is something you have to watch, monitor and fix it accordingly. Okay. So the take home message, okay. Proficiency testing is a very powerful tool, allows you to identify the problem, okay. And improve the performance of the laboratory. Okay, so pass or fail is not just 
what we need we need beyond that okay so a lot of information available it's up to the laboratory how we use this information not only use also uh, disseminate to the staff okay so that is pt so pt you are not taking uh, you are not doing every time so it's in a year one time or in once in a couple of years for different tests okay but every day you are producing test results so you rely upon your internal quality control okay so like i said at the beginning a regular internal assessment of the technical performance of the laboratory is necessary to assure validity okay so it allows you to like the internal quality control uh, ensures that factors determining the magnitude of uncertainty do not change because initially when you have your uh, uh, measurement and sanity estimation done and you have to always like keep an eye on that whether this is drifting from that range so this is what the internal quality control data can tell you okay and also tell whether this method validation is something it's a problem that do we have to uh, revalidate our method something so the internal quality data is something very important and the quality manager has to put this data together through some graphical illustration and also through some statistical analysis and get that information transferred to the lab staff to look into the problem if there are any problems. Okay. So here, when you have the internal quality control uh, check, so the one major question that we, we may have is the setting control limits, okay? So what is your acceptable uh, limit, okay? So QC, so QC there are different stage we are doing one is when you are doing within run precision if you are running icp or some other equipment like a gc so it takes few measurements within one run right so this uh, repeatability generally should be better okay but when you have same sample done two times between like 10 samples then that standard deviation for the same sample will be different right so that's why if you are setting it acceptable limit for within the precision that should be always lower but if it is for uh, between the run then probably it can be set higher okay? because definitely you run one sample one time you have three data same sample you run 10 times like after 10 samples again so this is another independent run but within that you will have three data also so that will be a larger uh, standard uh, deviation that's why to had higher with that, you have to you can set this slightly higher. It is acceptable, okay? But if you are able to show that even that can be fit within three sigma is always good because within run precision for certain equipments can be less than 1% also, so it's not a problem, okay? And choosing uh, the control material, okay, as a sample. So this is something you can have a formulation sample, you know, because it's very difficult to get the right matrix match standard calibration the, the reference material certified reference material and it's also expensive so you make something in-house but you use some of the reference standards to spike then you validate that one time then every time you use this sample is is, is just a kind of useful source for internal quality check okay? and once in a while you have to go for this external comparison this is what the PT, PT is okay. So PT is something occasionally happening. And what you are doing on a day-to-day -day basis is these are the things because within the run position, every time when you turn on your equipment and between the run, whenever you have a batch of 20 samples, so you have to show that. And setting the limit for these two, depending upon your laboratory performance, okay. So this I am not going to read all. So this is something, a technical note. So each equipment requires a different frequency for some checks that every lab may be doing, okay? So I'm not going to read this, and this is available in Singlas website, and you may have it in your, your, in your lab also. So what I wanted to uh, like highlight here, so like your lab may be doing this reference rate check for accuracy and the balance, but, your staff have they ever seen such a data to see how because in a sheet they may see every time they note down the rate and they based on the acceptable criteria they will say okay or not okay so you will see as a quality manager also just go and endorse okay this is properly recorded but once in a while if you can give this kind of 
illustration so that it will give some kind of uh, information for them to really do things more nicely. So it's important because the lab people who are doing extra work for quality has to feel that it is important. Right? It is not just for the sake of doing or fulfilling. So the data analysis and data interpretation should be done by the quality manager and should be disseminated to the lab staff once in three months, you know, as a quality meeting you can call it for and you can give some kind of highlight how the QC data is going around where people are lagging or where people are doing good jobs. So it's like a appreciating each other hard work and also showing some of the outcome and that can really motivate the lab staff. Okay, so apart from that, so what we are talking about is because initially what I mentioned is all about the equipment. So now when you have a method uh, QC check, right? For if you are doing trace elements in sea water or river water or in sediment. So you have to have some kind of uh, QC for this. This can be com uh, coming from some reference material or it can be something a blind duplicate sample or you can do some kind of formulation test. So this is different from what we have shown earlier because earlier one is for the equipment, this is for the method, okay? So all this data, this is what the important thing is. You have to analyze the data. So this is your expected concentration and this is the two, stand, two times, uh, two sigma, okay? So that will give you a kind of uh, the 95 95% confidence level. So you, this is considered a safe zone, you know? So you want every data point to fall in this and you are okay to fall with this warning limit and action limit. So anything above action limit means require immediate action, okay? So this is what. So when you say this two times standard deviation, so that means only 5% chance to fail, you know? 95% you will see that your data is falling here. So yeah, when it exceeds the three times standard deviation, definitely you need some immediate action, okay? And this is uh, another way of illustrating here. And also this is the inference. So when you have something, okay, under this action limit, it can be due to calibration problem or bad standard or mal equipment, the malfunctioning of equipment. It can be either of any reason. Then you got it correct. That means, okay, you got your new standard, so you fixed it, something like that. Okay, now you suddenly, you see another kind of downtrend. Could be because of degradation of calibration standard. And you have things all over, you know, like, then it could be something like a technical error of the equipment or the staff is new and do not have sufficient experience. So this is something, as I said, the quality managers should be able to make some kind of judgment and he should be able to confirm that also because his judgment cannot be a final one. Okay, so this is generally a kind of guidelines for uh, action item, you know. So when you have one data point falling above actual limit, it's okay. So you don't have to be panic. But when you have two or more, it's problem. Means even you cannot wait for third one, you know. Two is the red alert. So if you fall, see two data falling about action limit, which is three stand, three times standard deviation, then you have to do something immediate, okay? If you have this kind of seven times, you know, like continuous increasing or the downtrend or up, upward trend, you know, that is something is not good, you know? It tells you, you have some systematic error, you know? Because the, normally the random error is something that we cannot avoid, it can be minimized, but systematic error is something you can totally uh, get rid of. So 10 out of 11 should be like, it, it, it cannot be consecutively one side, you know, it has to scatter between the plus and minus uh, side of the actual value or the same value. Okay, so this is something you have to mainly look at it. And anything on the above three times standard deviation, the action limit point, if you have two data, then immediately you have to fix that before continuing your samples, okay? Yeah, this is a different way to illustrate the data. So this is what one will like to see it, okay? And this is something it's not good. So there's a shift in the control value. And again, shift in the control value downward trend. So ideally speaking, out of these four, you want to see something of this nature, you know, where one like odd 
data it's going about to standard deviation so mostly you are able to see everything so this is the ideal uh, situation data but in reality you may see all these three then you have to address it immediately okay so again this is a uh, same a kind of a rule you know like the standard deviation data how this should be uh, dealt you know to have action uh, so i am not going to read this again it's almost repetition of what because this is coming from a clinical lab and this is from a chemical testing lab so but more or less they are uh, of similar nature only okay. so here again what they are saying is one control value okay outside to standard deviation this is is not a problem but if you have more it's a problem so the three standard deviation rule is really a problem you know like you have to address it immediately and this four is just like four standard deviation that means out of four two you are getting on the positive side and two on the negative side so that's actually random error along with the systematic error so that is going very wide you know so that's not acceptable also so you have to see that even the error trend also whether it is like a downward or upward just to see whether it is coming from a random error or systematic error okay so with that i want to wrap up my uh, uh, lecture here so regular internal quality control checks and assessment okay an occasional external assessment through proficiency testing exercise will help to maintain the technical competency of the laboratory it is important to use the data collected and learn from it for improvement okay use the information from pt study and implement the required changes to keep the laboratory performance good consistently okay maintaining good laboratory quality in the lab operation will help improve credibility productivity and profitability so thank you for your attention now we will move on to the last uh, lecture then we will go for this uh, q and a okay mr reddy it's over to you now Okay, Mr. Reddy, are you able to share your yeah. screen? Yeah, hi, hi. Uh, uh, do you have a problem? Let me see, yeah, because... Otherwise, uh, I have to make uh, this presenter. Let me just let me know whether... You, oh, you can, you can able to see? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, you can go to presentation mode and we are good. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Shakti. Uh, okay, the subject given for me by SG Lab Forum is improving quality in laboratory operations. You all can hear me, right? Hello? Yes, Hello? we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. No problem. Yeah, okay. So please make uh, your slide in presentation mode. Eh? So then it's good. So yeah I, I will do that okay, okay thank you, so thank you. okay the subject given for me is improving quality in laboratory operations in fact the subject is a very huge subject it is the improving the word called improving of course quality in laboratory operations the previous two speakers they have already explained in some ways different ways, especially Dr. Karthik's uh, presentation is talking about the internal quality of the laboratory, all these things, but how to improve? It's a very big subject. We can discuss hours together for the specific scenario-based quality improvements. So here I have just focused only narrowing the most fundamental requirements. Let's say if you do have any questions, please note down maybe end of the session, we can discuss about this thing. Okay, now, there is a lot of uh, definitions. Just now, uh, Karthik's 
presentation also say conformance to requirements. Quality means conformance to requirements. Some people say quality is fitness for use. Some people further extended quality is fitness for use and its intended purpose of use. Some says quality in the eyes of customer. Some says quality is objective. It is not subjective. So overall quality is essential for survival. That is what we can agree. Okay, now we're talking about the improvement. The improvement, Cambridge Dictionary have a very good uh, definition. They say an occasion when something gets better or when you make it better. So here, something gets better occasionally is uh, we have to wait too long. But other way, when you make it better, uh, then there will be some improvement we can see. As quality professionals in laboratories, you can try to uh, move to this direction. When you make it better, then automatically the quality will getting better. Okay, now laboratory operations, what we call laboratory operation, all the measurement and testing activities and workflow associated with the test artifact. The test artifact can be sample, specimen, UUT or DUT to get accurate measurement results with the lowest uncertainty. So this is called laboratory operations. So here the keyword accurate measurement results with the lowest uncertainty, irrespective of sample, specimen, UUT or DUT, whatever. So this is all about. Okay, what we should have for this? Basically, I have here, there is, you can see one uh, here, the, the small window here, what is the things it's uh, asking about. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Okay. So the second slide is okay. He's talking about the laboratory quality. Laboratory quality begins before you stepping inside the lab. Okay, what are the things? The main, main basic things are technology, you must be very sure about the technology for testing labs, calibration and measurement labs, either medical manufacturing companies, clinical, pathological, research, chemical, NDT, there are different, different standards are there. So that is based on the technology. Knowledge, you must have a proper education, especially for chemical, medical, pharmaceutical, for this kind of uh, laboratory operations, you must have a former qualification, educational qualification. Then you must have a proper training, certification, also standards and compliance. So this is another one. Then third thing is you must have a clear objectives for testing methods, procedures and SOPs, data collection methods, data analysis, uncertainty calculation, and also reporting final results. The third thing, fourth thing is discipline, maintaining reference standards, comparisons, test accuracy ratios, so-called TAR, or test uncertainty ratio, TUR, test sequences, and real-time testing. So we must have a very disciplined approach. The fifth one is hygiene, especially for pharmaceutical, medical, and clinical operations. This kind of laboratories, cleanliness, cleanliness is a paramount importance. Personal and hygiene conditions, some operations need to have dress code ethics. Okay. Gowns. Shetty, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Can you put it in uh, full screen mode because uh, people cannot read it sometime. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, thank you. 
I'm trying, but I don't know why. Suddenly lock. Yeah, you can put the slideshow on top, you know, like slideshow that should help. Uh, on top, after animation, there is slideshow, right? Uh, that should help also. Uh, home after is, animation. Yeah, there's on top, you know, like a, there is a bar where you have home, insert, design, transition, animation, slideshow. The PowerPoint, you know, because you you have to go back. You have to stop sharing first. You have to stop sharing screen. Okay. Yeah, because now you may be in full screen mode, so you won't be able to. You stop screen first. No, no, you, you stop your screen sharing first. Okay. You have to. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah no. Open and maybe you can check first, you know, like there is a presentation mode. So you see where is that and you find that icon. So are you able to find it? Because if you open your PowerPoint right on top, you have a kind of a different thing, you know, like home, insert, design, transition, animation, slideshow. If you click on slideshow and from beginning, that is one way. Another way is at the bottom, uh, the right bottom, you know, where you can see all screen in small, like all slides, a slide shorter or there is a one called slideshow. So, so you, either you can use this option or that option. Can I show you in the PDF? Yeah, it's okay because as long as they are able to see uh, the full slide, it's okay, fine. Okay, let me show you in the PDF. Huh? Mm -hmm. Screen share. Okay, there is another suggestion. You just press like F five. That also will help. Eh? You can try that. Eh? Maybe different. My laptop don't have that option. Eh? Yeah, there is. My F five is it? Yeah, that's what he say. One person say, Alan. Oh. Now can see. No, you you have to share it first. You know because now it's not shared. You have to share a screen, then choose this file. Yeah, now you are sharing. Okay, good. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I cannot move the slide. I don't know why. Yeah, you can use the cursor also. Eh? The cursor to. Yeah, there's a. There's a 
lower upper cursor right so the cursor also can help yeah it's moving okay yeah, uh, the tech we are talking about the technology just now after that uh, i was i was in the fifth see so Okay, discipline, we are talking about the discipline, hygiene, safety. Safety is another paramount importance also. Uh, in the calibration laboratories, the quality will reflect by having the people wearing the proper safety, uh, personal protective equipment, hand gloves, goggles, face masks, distancing, isolation, non-interference, all these kind of things. Another one is uh, environmental, the proper environmental control, certain Calibration activities, certain testing activities, measurement activities requires temperature and humidity control, airflow, pressure, soundproof, lighting requirements. Also, some testing requires clean room. And the last, the not last, last but least one, uh, last one, integrity. The test results. You must have a proper archiving method, sample protection, retention, identification of unit under test, device under test, packing and labeling requirements. The final one is the confidentiality. So also need to maintain the secrecy until the complete test result is known. Do not give as a quality of the laboratory cannot give a laboratory result until and unless if it's completed, all the test sequences completed. So there is uh, some of the, uh, sometimes it will be tend to give half results to the customer because customer wants it. But after that you want to, when you finally, when you want to give the full result, then you want to take back, there is so many uh, issues, okay? Now, let's go to the next one. Sorry. Again, problem. Okay. okay. What is quality in laboratory operations? There is one very good guide, which is a good laboratory practice for quality assurance of the laboratory results. It is a NIST guide, they call GLP-1. I have given here in my presentation, the link, uh, maybe probably later, if you guys want, I can uh, share with you, okay. Sorry, yeah, I got some problem today, I don't know why. Okay, next, there are so many WHO guidelines for laboratory quality control. WHO, I think you all know very well, uh, World Health Organization, they specifically wrote uh, several uh, quality control uh, guidelines uh, that is for uh, clinical applications, then non-medical, non-clinical applications, medical uh, equipment manufacturing, laboratory, uh, pharmaceutical for these things. So uh, number two, number three, number four, number five, all these are that. Uh, other than that, there is a handbook for a precise, concise handbook was written by WHO, which is also giving a fantastic uh, good laboratory practices for regulated non-clinical research, which is applicable for uh, many of the other uh, direct uh, medical applications. Uh, so these are the things. Okay. Compliance to laboratory quality management systems and standards and guidelines, such as we have ISO 17025. I think in our previous speakers, Karthik and uh, Mr. Yao already mentioned about 17025 requirements. Other than, that, other than that, nowadays it's very important, ISO 15189. The 15189 is about the uh, medical, uh, is a standard about the uh, medical laboratories. 
and ISO 13485, which is for uh, medical equipment manufacturers. We also have uh, FDA regulations. Then more on GXPs. Uh, we will talk about that later. Then GMP, GLP, MHRA, which is a UK regulatory agency. Other than that, we have Alcoa, CLSI, GPs, 26, A3, 21 CFR part 11. I think some of you are already in the calibration laboratories, especially those who are in temperature and humidity, you have come across this 21 CFR part 11 requirements. Okay, then first one is compliance to standards, methods, procedures, and SOPs. Second one is qualification, knowledge, experience, training, and competency evaluation of calibration laboratory personnel. Third one is reference instruments and their accuracy, whether it can meet test accuracy ratio, traceability, national or international traceabilities, sampling methods that is for uh, not mainly for calibration laboratories, for those testing laboratories, NDT or destructive test, those kind of thing. Test kits, UUTs, unit under test, device under test. Fourth one is laboratory, environmental conditions and ambient control. Fifth one is analytical skills. The analytical skills and also the data integrity, uncertainty, level of confidence and results. The sixth one is interpretation and reporting. These are all reflects a good quality practices in a laboratory. Okay. Again, got stuck. Stuck. See the sharing of problem, Karthik? Yeah, I think then you can stop sharing again, close the PowerPoint and open it again eh, sometime. Then if your laptop is tired. Eh? Uh, it's not laptop, it's a new laptop, but the thing is, I don't know why. Uh, Okay, so yeah, I think you can stop uh, uh, like sharing screen first, close the PowerPoint and open it again, should, should work. Difficult to uh, Karthik, we do in this way. Uh, can you give me your email ID so then I will forward to you? Then you can open there. Yeah, the SG lab members at gmail.com. Eh? Hold on, huh? then yeah. you can, yeah, uh, SG lab members at gmail.com. SG lab members all one word lab members yeah at gmail.com at gmail.com yeah dot com yeah Okay, so I have closed. You want to try again, or you want me to share this screen for you? In case, if let's say if happen something, then I will. Uh, it's okay. So I it. can I can move the slides for you. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, you you, you have you sent it already? Wait, wait. Uh,
Yeah, uh, I sent already. You try okay. whether you can open or not. Uh, okay, let me see whether I have received it. Yet. I have not received yet. Maybe uh, I have to give a couple of minutes. Not yet, not yet. Is he already? Not yet, not yet. So you just check whether you are sent to the right uh, email. Eh? I just send you now the message. Eh? SG, SG lab members. Members, yeah. Uh, at gmail.com. Okay, yeah, got it now. Yes. So you can maybe, maybe you can open either one of them and then you can just scroll. Sure, 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 sure. Okay. So sorry guys, uh, so it's an unexpected interruption. So. Okay, let me open up now. Okay, so where are we? Uh, you can go to the second. This is the one, I think, right? Uh, the, the third one, yeah. This one, th this one done already? I think uh, you, are, yeah. you are discussing on the fifth point, analytical skills and data integrity. Yeah. Okay, let me show you. Okay. Okay, the, the guidelines are already uh, are done already. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, analytical skills, fifth point. The last one is interpretation and uh, reporting. Okay, now the next one is, next slide is about quality in laboratory operations again. The laboratory quality management system standards and guidelines such as ISO 17025, which is general requirements for competence and impartiality and consistent operation of laboratories. Here, there is uh, something uh, you all can note down. Uh, the standard third, third edition, 17025, 2017, they mentioned general requirement of, for competence of laboratories because there is some countries they are referring as impartiality and consistent operation of laboratories because this impartiality and uh, uh, the other clauses their risk assessment all these things they have added inside so the second one is iso 15189 which is quality management system requirement for medical laboratories third one 13485 which is a 2016 version medical devices manufacturing for requirements for regulatory purposes. So these all the three definitely those calibration and uh, uh, testing laboratories for them they are the they could be the customers also they may be requesting you to come and audit. So one or the other way, 15189 is already mentioned inside 17025 standard. So 13485 also it's a part of uh, medical, so they will come and audit you. So it is uh, important to take note, these are the three standards, definitely you need to be prepared. Although 17025 not covered some of the 15189 and 13485 requirements, but customer come to audit you and they will go through their checklist, which is their checklist is either 15189 or 13485 com compliance. Okay. the. Third one is FDA US Food and Drug Administration regulations, which is uh, many people knows about this one uh, because the FDA regulations are uh, since long time. The fourth one is those who are serving for aerospace industries, they have specific requirements, pyrometry requirements under AMS 2750, which is just re revised from revision E to revision F. And there is a lot of stringent 
requirements for laboratories added other than the heat treatment and other things. Okay, the other things are GXPs. We later we talk about GXPs such as GMP and GLP. So GMP already there in manufacturing uh, industries for many uh, years. GLP also there, good laboratory practices. So these are all actually most fundamental basics for the international standards actually. If you go through the class by class of uh, the GX, GXPs, then you can see what are the GXPs. You can see the right side, there is a logo there, GXP, GMP, good manufacturing practice, good distribution do, documentation practice, good uh, uh, what I call uh, laboratory practice and GCP, all these things, MHRA, there is a UK have one uh, agency, regulatory agency called MHRA. They also come out with a very stringent uh, requirement for regulating UK regulators for medicines. Then Alcoa nowadays is quite popular because of uh, digitization or uh, data integrity requirements. A lot of uh, things are very much need to follow with Alcoa, especially FDA is the one who come out with this Alcoa. And then Alcoa now again have another, another four additional elements, which is Alcoa plus. Then CLSI GP 26A3, application for quality management system model in for laboratory services in clinical and laboratory standards. So this is another part but we don't talk about much about this one because we are not medical professionals. This is basically clinical and laboratory standards. 21 CFR part 11, code of federal regulations is all already there for many years. And now because of electronic records and electronic signatures, there is some other requirements, which is 21 CFR part 11. Uh, last one, 21 CFR 4.1.12 edition. This, this one talking about quality assurance unit. <clears throat> they are given in dollar sign 58.35, 58.185, 58.190, Certain companies are strictly following this one also. Go to the next slide. Hello. Okay, now data integrity and validation. So as I mentioned, FDA is the one who first come out with this data integrity. It is essential to validation of processes in pharmaceutical and medical manufacturing facilities. Following the Alcoa principles is the best way to achieve the goal. What is Alcoa? Alcoa is the first one. Attributable, legible, contemporaneous, original, and accurate. This is the very first elements come out from FDA and attributable. It is important any laboratory data when you are having, it should be identified the person or computer, which computer system collected this data and record the date of this data generation. Legible, so it should be able to clearly read the data, okay? That is in terms of record keeping purposes, you must be able to clearly read the data either from computers or from the hard copies. Contemporaneous record of any activity at the time it takes place. This is very important because in different times, in different environmental conditions, the reading or the data may be different when you are collecting the data. It may not be the same. Originality. The record should be original, whether it's a handwritten record or whether it's a transcript, which is later part, it is uh, copied to the other permanent form or anything. So it should be original, then accurate. The reality of what happened, error-free, should be no editing of the original information. So nowadays you can see a lot of data acquisition systems, data loggers, they are confirmed to these uh, 
requirements, which is 21 CFR Part 11, 21 CFR Code of uh, Federal Regulations also asking for that. They say our data acquisition systems confirm so because uh, to the uh, requirements, data integrity requirements, which is you cannot alter the original data. The next is added one, just now I mentioned Alcoa Plus, it should be complete, consistent, enduring and available. Okay, complete means in terms of audit trial, nothing has been deleted or lost. There's no way to delete because now all the data you through digitization, you can keep the soft copies of data either in scanned form or in the original form or PDF form or whatever you can keep uh, uh, complete recorded data. It should be consistent. Primarily data is in chronological order, either date wise or serial number or whatever the date time stamping wise, it should be a consistent in the sequence. You should not uh, make users and users or the auditors to go and search or with this day or this time like that. So it should be continuous. Enduring, it is also important to have uh, these kind of data shall, supposed to be data available for long period after it's recorded, you must ensure. And available either in the form of electronically or in the form of hard copy. So these are the four things which is added. So this reflects a good quality of the laboratory operations. If you are able to have this kind of Alcoa plus principles, it is easier for your validation process, whether you are externally participating in any pharmaceutical or medical device companies, if you are providing your calibration services or testing services, if they ask you to validate their equipments or anything. So if these kind of policies, if this kind of elements, if you are in, integrated with your quality system, it will be very good. This is one of the way of improving laboratory operations. The next slide, please. Hello. Hello. It's already Hello? moved. Yeah. Okay. You, you, are you not able to see? Yeah. Uh, okay. Quality in laboratory operations. So now we are coming back to our the big list, the technology standards or these things. So standards. I have listed out here only the calibration laboratory standards, which is essential for various uh, schedules and scopes related. Example for temperature. If you are running a temperature lab, you must know what is ITS 90. In the late 90s, this standard uh, was uh, established from ITS 60 or something. So it is called international temperature scale. It is basically, they have fixed some of the fixed points, either from the frozen, uh, for the negative side is from the freeze points, for the positive, positive side is for the melting points of various uh, elements. Okay, then we also have uh, ISO IEC 60751, which is basically for platinum resistance thermometers or RTDs. So this standard, which is revised in 2008, 60584, we have one, two, and three. These are the three standards. Of course, uh, 60584 is for thermocouples and 60751 is for RTDs. So basically the laboratories, temperature calibration laboratory should be very much familiar with this. Okay, then we are talking about ASTM E220. ASTM E220 is a similar like ISO IEC 60584, but it is in ASTM documentation uh, uh, standard. Okay, then we have uh, ISO 8061, which is also medical electrical equipment, talking about the infrared, thermography, all these kind of things. Then we have ASTM E1965, which is talking about the wideband infrared equipments. Then ASTM E28714, 
also we have uh, uh, accuracy for verification of wideband uh, infrareds. Then ISO IEC 60068, basically mapping requirements, whether warehouse mapping or temperature ovens or climatic chambers like temperature and humidity, all these things. Pressure, of course, there is a vacuum standard 3567. Then the grand old 837 for burden tube analog pressure gauges. Then we also have some NPL guide which is many of the laboratories, even NPL UK, they're all following, which is very precise and concise guide, which is, uh, I have mentioned the ISBN uh, number. Similarly, for relative humidity also, there is a NPL guide. Uh, then the so-called industry experts like Rotronic, Vaisala, they have written their own guides, which is also very much compliance with the international standard requirements. Then for acoustic and sound level calibration, there are some standards like ISO 6926, 2016, then 61672, then IEC 61672. These are all uh, for type one and type two sound level uh, or noise level uh, detectors, sound level meters. Then the stopwatch and timers. Generally, I listed here is uh, most of the laboratories have this scope. So this is uh, ISO 19235 2015. There is a standard and uh, there is a very good NIST practice guide 2009. And also there is a, for digital stopwatches, there is a standard called 10553. So all these standards, what does it mean? It represents if you are thorough, if you are very knowledgeable in your laboratory, and you are following either fully or partly. So this will give a very good impression for your customer. And it is one step ahead than your laboratory improvement. Because you, when you issue a certificate to a calibration, so to an end user, the end user will treat your certificate is very strong back background because you are very familiar with the standards and requirements. So this is one of the thing. Next slide, please. Okay. Is it the one correct one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So quality in laboratories, laboratory operations. Just now we are talking about GXP. Nowadays everything is about GXPs because what is X? X stands for good practices, quality guidelines. So X stands for various fields, good practices in terms of quality. So quality guidelines and regulations. So you can see in the right side, just now as mentioned, uh, uh, the there is a circular monogram there and uh, GXP is at the center. All this leads to the good practices. The laboratory, so-called what we are talking about, improvement in laboratory, it starts from the good practices. So you can see good manufacturing practices, GCP, good clinical practices, good laboratory practices, which we are now talking about, GSP, good storage practices, good distribution practices, good review practices. Okay, next. So there is a time. Uh, can you click one more time? Hello? Okay. So soon or later, the every processes and activities, there will be GXPs because it is proven for many years, many standards and international standards are also established based on GXPs. So 
is a good time for starting GXPs. Whether you are in calibration lab, then you can go for GLP. Although GLP states uh, many of the things uh, related to the medical and pharmaceutical uh, requirements, but there is certain good things which is for uh, in general for laboratories, whether it's a calibration laboratory or testing laboratory or NDT laboratory. Okay, now next. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Gone already? Hello? Yeah, this is the one, right? Yeah, this is the one, correct. The quality in laboratory is safety, hygiene, cleanliness, and PPEs. Okay. Now, safety is a paramount requirement in laboratories. Okay. It reflects the quality of work carried out in the laboratories. Workplace safety measures, workmen safety, and product safety. There are three things. Workplace safety means it's more for workmen. Product safety is for customer equipment or the samples given by the customers or your own equipments, references. This is all product safety. And then another one is hygiene, cleanliness, or this thing. This will reflect any laboratory's quality also. Okay, safety and PPEs. For example, in a temperature calibration lab, the, the gloves to prevent thermal shock, face masks, face shields, if you are working in fluid baths at high temperature, like more than 100 degree, so that kind of things. And then cold rooms and freezer rooms, it is also necessarily to have proper attires when we are doing on-site calibration with the long sleeve jackets and neck straps. When you are doing ovens and furnaces, it is also important well, to have high temperature, long sleeve gloves. For warehouse mapping, work at height ladders, proper ladders, harnesses for warehouse mapping, sensor placement kind of activities. If you have Caesar leaf license or how to operate all these things is even better instead of climbing on ladders. So these are all the safety aspect. For pressure calibration, Whenever you are doing high pressure calibration, it is very good to have, it is not good, it's actually must Google goggles, anti-slippery cotton gloves, safety boots, all these things. Likewise, medical and pharmaceutical laboratories, we have separate requirements in the next slide, it will be seen, shown. Lab coats, face masks, goggles, powder-free vinyl gloves, all these things. Electrical and electronic testing facilities shall have anti-shock, high voltage gloves. Of course, for electronic testing, you must have wrist anti-statics. So safety, safety is uh, proper handling guidelines, operators with consensus, eye vision, color blindness, all these things, another thing. And uh, hygiene and cleanliness, especially for medical and ph pharmaceutical and life sciences, it is very important to prevent contamination. They have you could have noticed when you are going, they have periodic or weekly or sometimes daily or maybe alternative days, five years cleanliness program. These neatness reflects the quality of operations in lab laboratories also. Next. Hello. Okay, the next one uh, showing the lab coat, which is uh, face mask protective goggles, and then the face shields, protective hand gloves, wrist antistatics, all these for different, uh, uh, basically the medical and pharmaceutical companies, you can see the clean room gowns, all these things. So this is another thing. Okay, now the next one. <coughs> We have a very important thing here. When the quality in the laboratory operations have issues, this is very interesting thing. Okay, every laboratory, if we think in customer centric 
approach and customer centric thinking that is, there will not be much issues about quality because customer will dictate what they want and laboratories can deliver according to customer requirements in laboratories nowadays it is inevitable because in singapore alone we have a lot of laboratories now accredited laboratories so one small piece of share we are we have so many exercises we need to do so that's why let's reveal a couple of scenarios and where quality related issue causes okay the first one the very dark blue one you can see too many customer complain in a year if you have a few like two or three four five uh, maybe can able to manage customer complaint of course it is also depending on how severe complaint it is second one do not have repeat customers then one customer one time they come they experience very good you are very good service they run away already so that is another issue consistently the revenue is dropping or stagnant so this is another issue so no matter what you do the end of the day if you don't have much income or your revenue is not growing or it is stagnated there that means your laboratory is not doing well maybe some problem with the quality or maybe something else so basically the first one is uh, the first row is about commercial aspects sales related or the second one the slightly the red color one no qualified and experienced staff is is another problem with laboratories either qualified experienced staff leaving then there is no suitable replacement either there is a suitable replacement very costly so the company or the laboratory lost a very good qualified hand so this is another problem old equipments and references some laboratories they are only proud for their own existing equipments but the technology every day changes the people are customer are looking for higher accuracy higher uncertain i mean lower uncertainty all these things leads to make your equipments consistently upgrading also lack of training proficiency knowledge base probably when you are sending uh, when the laboratory is sending their uh, laboratory calibration officers or technical staff to nnc training or those kind of uh, professional training then they will know what is the gap so the new things they can learn they can also become proficient their knowledge base will be getting increased so this is another thing okay the last one is the gray color dark gray color one non compliances to the standards or update no updates or certification issues every year you got a major non conform significant non conformances findings from the laboratories sorry the from the uh, assessment from the uh, uh, certification body so they give you a big non conformance which you really cannot do and moreover you are not complying for the standards maybe 50% compliance 60% compliance another 40% no and there is no updates standards always keep on changing whether we won't know one if you become uh, consistently if you are uh, uh, maybe if you are a member of singapore standards board or those topan lifang they will update for you so what are the changes and then from there you can really look into your own requirement whether this standard applies for your calibration scope or schedule then you can upgrade or update the second one in the gray color is about non participation of pt test i think already dr kartik is already mentions uh, about the importance of pt test i will not go through ilc test so some some laboratories are only just 
enough to satisfy the technical uh, note, the SAC Singlas technical note of participation twice, one discipline, twice, two, twice in a year. So, but these are other things really doesn't give any improvement for the laboratory because once twice in a year is too late. So you have to consistently participate in PT tests, provided if it is within your scope. Then the fourth one, third one is here, logistic issues, dis delays. Maybe your frontline is committing one date, then you have so many reasons. I think in the past one, one or two years, during this COVID situation, we have noticed there are delays, considerable delays. We cannot fulfill the promises given to the customer. We after you calibrate, we will return this item, or maybe in your site this day we will perform your on site. So second one, other than the logistic or delays, no response to customers, especially now. Quite okay, la. Otherwise, work from home. We cannot access, maybe a lot of hiccups. So only when you go to the office, you can know customer responses, all these things. So all these things, operational quality issues in the, as a whole, the first one is, as I mentioned, it is the, uh, what you call uh, frontline. Second one is about the standard. Third one is about the operational. Okay, the next one. Okay, the best thing is in the laboratory, if you have this approach, I think we all know the five, four M and one E, men, machine, material methods. So when the quality of the laboratory has issues, the best thing, uh, Dr. Karthik always say quality manager, quality manager. I'm also a quality manager, but it's not necessary if you are a supervisor or if you are a manager inside the calibration laboratory, you can just do a cause and effect fishbone diagram and you can apply personal facilities, procedures, equipments, standards. Where is your problems? The cause and effect, the left side is cause, the right side, the green color is the effect. So it will lead to a good measurement results. So now let's go through quickly one by one. I'm also lagging behind the time because of the hiccup. Okay, qualification and knowledge and experience, we already talked about it. Inter and intra lab comparison. The intra laboratory comparison is one of the, uh, uh, what I call uh, emphasis in the new standard to, to 2017 version. Interlab was there, PT was there in the past. Intralab was not there. This is another thing the laboratory can always can do. This is the best way to improve your quality. Intralab is you can do the same equipment with the different persons in your laboratory. The different equipment with the same person also these comparisons and tests and the results you can evaluate. Training and effectiveness, not necessarily you need to send the training for, for other, if you are really, if you can able to understand the requirements, you can conduct your own training in a week, one or two hours, maybe you can spend the mass training or maybe individual training who are freshers or new one. So this is the personal related things. Facilities. All these things, just uh, 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 let you all know, uh, the NIST GLP-1, it is already having this one. You can, when you are reading, you can see. Facilities, capabilities, calibration data and results with the author automation and software integration. Now, there is a lot of government support for digitization, software, all these things. It's a good time to take this one, the improve your capabilities and capacities. So facilities, you can go for automation, laboratory automation, softwares, all these things. And environmental effects and influence and effects. Okay, this is the thing you can reduce with the proper maintenance of uh, control of temperature, air con, all these things. So especially the, the some of the parameters which are directly having influence, for example, temperature, humidity, pressure, these are all mainly uh, influenced by the environmental temperature or uh, pressure, airflow, all these things. 
the monitoring limits and capability ranges so consistently you need to look into tightening your limits limits means your tolerances because some people still referring to ta or test accuracy ratio which is 1 to 10 or 1 to 4 more than 4 because your reference instrument supposed to be four times better than your customers uut so monitoring limits you have to tighten your this thing capability ranges maybe sometimes you have no full range you don't have capability for tool full range so you have to consistently think about upgrading your range also where when customer seeing next year your schedule your sac singla schedule they must be proud uh, about your they must be something impressed not proud impressed about the next year your uh, uh, achievement procedures the method verification and validation this is very important the method verification and validation especially your sops and procedures annual review and updates and revisions is very important so i already mentioned the procedures also must have intralab comparisons must emphasize for intralab comparisons especially in training and evaluation and uh, re-evaluation or this thing some study about repeatability reproducibility about your product about about your references is important you must have a good uncertainty analysis either by software or your own by excel spreadsheets replication of measurements already just now uh, in the previous uh, talk uh, uh, dr karthik also mentioned you must replicate the measurements to have the buyer to eliminate the bias or maybe the repeatability issues so this is the thing equipments again facilities we are talking about the facilities equipment we must have proper equipments except within the acceptance tolerance uh, this is you need to always must be cautious because when you have a schedule you must always able to, you will forget when some equipment is getting faulty or maybe out of service so you must suitably do the maintenance or replace then of course the control charting all these things in the previous talk we already learned comparison of repeatability equipment to equipment so this is another way to make sure our equipments are fitting fitting in the requirements so standards we already talked about the suitable calibration interval uh, we must have not for calibration lab, already SAC Singlas have got guide, guidelines, ILAC MRA got guidelines, uh, APEC also got guidelines, the calibration intervals for laboratory equipment. So all these things are important. Industry practices and guidelines, either national or international. So industry very changes, very, uh, it's a dynamic. Now people talking about 4G, 5G, all these things. So there are changes also. We have to carefully study what are the changes. Check our own standards, whether it's a national standard or international standard, whether it's an MC traceable or UCAS traceable or somewhere at DAX or PTV, wherever it is. Proper care and handling of references and instruments, especially those kind of fragile things like your standard PRTs, like your fixed points, like water triple points, all these things and then we also need to do the past previous calibration history by doing the simple charting control charting the previous year what is the drift previous year what is uncertainty all these things you can plot then easy for the calibration officer to refer so this is the another thing so all these are all the improvements which can lead to a good quality in the laboratory. So that's why this fishbone chart, so-called cause and effect chart will be a very good brainstorming for everybody. You can just write your own, then after that you can discuss with your management and then you can come out with a very good solution or especially for facilities and equipments, the resources to improve your capabilities. So this is one of the things. Okay, next, we move quality assurance in laboratory measurement results, measurement assurance program. The measurement assurance program 
already uh, in uh, we have discussed in the past okay the important thing let's uh, let me go through a bit fast understanding easy to understand interpret careful about the clause 7.8.7.1 .7 in the you cannot do a interpretation if it is not supported by any standard you can say anything but don't write in your calibration report you must write in outside you can put an appendix or whatever it is not a part of calibration report if it is you are doing interpretation so please read carefully there are they are emphasizing for interpret but you want to do interpretation you must have a proper things just now whatever we go through knowledge all these uh, standard compliance all these things but 7.8.7.1 .7 i am strongly emphasizing people to read and understand modeling methodology so the method a already you are following from several years why you can do method a1 revision 1 improvement so there may be something methodology improvement measuring techniques and references last time you take manual data maybe now why don't you go for data acquisition so your references you can find references with which can interface to your server or maybe by LAN, uh, LAN system or maybe RS-235 or maybe you can able to collect the data through electronic gadgets. So this one non-interference of human error or consistency of taking the data one minute, two minute, all these things. So the measuring improvement, uncertainty evaluation, try to follow GCM or GUM guidelines. There are so many experts wrote JCM, uh, sorry, uh, uncertainty evaluation guidelines. There are so many people are giving training. So GC, the uncertainty evaluation, but if you closely look at the, these uncertainty topics and classes, that is either related to their specific scope or schedule, not for all the kind of uh, uh, application maybe it, it is not suitable for temperature not suitable for pressure maybe it is suitable for chemical and chemical testing maybe it is suitable for another uh, ndt testing so that kind of thing so uncertainty evaluation consistently and constantly you need to uh, upgrade and also the calibration officers need to be uh, trained managing all these things the modeling, uncertainty, all the use and ends. So it is called measurement assurance program. So this is another way to improve the quality of the laboratory. So it is also, just now, as I mentioned to you, it should be appropriate to your laboratory schedule and scope of activities. The SSC Singlas give you a schedule, so you must in line with that. You don't do something else which is not approved by SAC. You can do maybe for traceable or if a non-accredited certificate, if you are issuing to your set customer. Okay, quality control, quality assurance methods, are internal and external data. Quality control, we are talking about internal quality assurance about external, external. So both internal and external data evaluation is important. Let's say if you are getting calibrated your reference by outside cap or if you are getting your reference calibrated by National Metrology Center or any international traceability. So whether you are calibrating from in internally, so it's carefully evaluating the results is very important. So you also can do in ongoing basis by checking the stability control or these things. So the next slide is I'm, what I'm giving here a close view is in the word, the word quality is repeated in ISO 17025 2017 version for eight times. Quality control is repeated for four times. It basically 7.7 .7 question, uh, section number 7.7, .7, just now Mr. Uh, Yao go, gone through already. So I will not go through again. So it is very important for reference materials or certified reference materials or so-called quality control materials. So these are other things. 
intralab comparisons again class 3.4 7.7.1 j is emphasizing for intralab comparisons this is nothing to do with interlab comparisons or proficiency test intralab is to make sure you have a consistency you have a common uh, uh, practice in the lab so you do one way your colleague do other way so this is not something is not right so let everybody do in the same way so intralab comparison is one of the way okay 7.7.1 uh, already there are some highlights here quality control use of alternative functional check i think you can go and read the thing yourself intermediate checks replication same or different methods retesting recalibration retained items let's say customer never collected you can go and retest it and uh, uh, redo it what happens sometimes when you test or when you calibrate after that something will suddenly pop up in your mind hey, last year i do this thing this year i never check so it's better to go and immediately before goes to customer you bring back and do it retesting or recalibration and confirm what you have done sometimes when you testing you will not know when you do the data analysis you will uh, find hey this one i never do correlation of results it's also very good review as i mentioned to you intra lab comparisons you can give let's say if you have got doubt you can ask your colleague to check not all all the functions whatever you have doubt certain certain functions certain uh uh functions in that particular equipment you can ask them plain sample test mainly this one can supervisors and managers can do blind sample testing okay so all these things again uh, 7.72 already is uh, gone through so you can see here technical note proficiency testing pro policies and proficiency testing you can just now uh, uh, we are go gone through in the previous uh, uh, lecture so this one you can go through for your additional this thing uh, understanding okay now measurement assurance data it should be regular use of reference materials either it is a quality control or certified either weekly basis or fortnightly this is what glp mentioned so glp good laboratory practice one by nist so you can when you see they ask for regular use either weekly or fortnightly basis functional checks measuring and testing equipments always you must do either it is a blind check or whatever periodic intermediate check monthly quarterly uh, use of standard deviation charts or control charts customer items if is not collected i already told correlation of results previous result previous year results of current result of similar item results similar for example in electrical uh, you can have a similar equipment you have calibrated in the past you can compare if it is not too old if it's a new item okay intra lab comparison blind test okay now next one all these things i am not going through because we already gone through this one uh, how we can minimizing risk by uh, this thing you can uh, these slides are not confidential if uh, uh, dr kartik is willing to share with you you can ask him uh, we, there is a copy of uh, pdf also he can send to you so you can read yourself because we are already our question and our answer was we are running short of time is already 15 minutes exceeded you can read yourself from 18 slide number 18 so what is minim minimizing risk in the laboratory what i understand from my professional experience if you have a good training either internal internal training or external training you can minimize risk you remember i always count i have a bad habit of counting the wordings in the standard 36 times in the standard iso 17025 2017 version mentioned risk everywhere risk 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 why they risk mention risk because it is the job it is assurance from the laboratory 
by following this international standard to mitigate the risk. So that is why they keep mentioning risk. So to minimize risk, this slide number 18, you can go through. So slide number 19 again, okay. The GLP again, some evaluations of calibration past history before and after calibration. So before you send for calibration, after you calibration, what is the performance, especially external calibration provider, because sometimes some of the calibration, external calibration will not give you as found as left results. There is only either as left results or there is no information about that. So you don't know whether they have adjusted. So you can conduct some integrity tests. So then you will know whether something is adjusted or not adjusted. Okay, review of historical data, calibration data, you will, definitely you will have a file, the equipment history file, so, or reference history file. So you can take that and you can find. Participation of proficiency testing, try to, I encourage you participate more and more proficiency testing whether fail just now, our previous lecture, Dr. Karthik say, fail, never mind, give another attempt to pass and get it better. And if you are EN ratio in our calibration and measurement, we are not talking about Z score and uh, we are talking about EN ratio, okay? So EN ratio, if it is close to one, try to reduce, if anything more than 6.6, .6, yeah, then you have to do something. Maybe participate in another PT or maybe conduct a more and more interlap. You sponsor some interlap or before that, if you don't have confidence to spend money or uh, uh, time to participate in interlab, you can do intralab. You can do your own staff. You choose your senior staff to junior staff or junior staff to supervisor or vice versa. You can do a different combination and do intralab comparison test. So this is another way. So externally obtained data from calibration. Sometimes you also can blindly send your own references to other lab to know what is the capability, where are you stand, whether you are always internally in, in house calibration you are doing. Sometimes it's good to compare with the external. Then participation of interlab comparison, training activity, method of validation, all these things. So, from all these, what we say, I'm emphasizing the GLP-1, the NIST, the GLP-1 also telling about measurement assurance program. If you have a proper measurement assurance program in your laboratory, you definitely, you will have a improvement on laboratory activities, especially laboratory measurement results. So data analysis, to have better control on your results. You must have a proper data analysis. It will also preventing incorrect results giving to your customer, wrong result give. After that, yeah, you can say sorry, but what the impression is, first impression is always last impression about results and accuracy is concerned. The first impression, you give a wrong result. After that, you can say thousand sorries and you can withdraw that uh, report and then you can give a very fantastic, beautiful report with the very this thing. But if you are a, if the laboratory end user is a technical person, he will make you a lot of questions to answer why it's like that. And then end up, you have to answer to the corrective action of them also, right? So statistical evaluation is another way, okay? So all these things. So now I'm going to this end of the last one. So what is I'm, my emphasis for good quality or continuous improvement of quality in laboratory measurement results, the entire quality control system or quality assurance system in a laboratory must focus on personnel. You must have a experienced staff, if you don't have experience, difficult to find or retain to the laboratories, experienced staff, you must get ready another person. You have to give opportunities to grow your own internal colleagues. So encourage them, 
and then train them to take over very efficient manner so the laboratory name laboratory fame everything will be will be there facilities and accommodations try to improve your facilities and accommodation when the auditors sometimes nowadays i think last two years you have less auditors from customers maybe because of covid they do desktop audit or remote audit or zoom audit or microsoft team audit or these kind of things so when the customer is visiting as an auditor your facility they don't never see improvement last two years or so ago also you are same now also you are same then there's no confidence on you suddenly they will go and find another one because they don't have they also cannot rely on you they must have a supplier b supplier c like that so they will whenever they call the facilities and accommodations you need to consistently improve procedures and method validation you have to there is no nothing wrong if a procedure is keep on changing revision 1 revision 2 revision 3 revision 4 it will give a good confidence that you have procedures and methods are validated reviewed annually reviewed or periodically reviewed equipments and references of course i already mentioned the industry is moving it is dynamic now 4g industry become 5g and people are looking for new one and especially from this pandemic we learn a lot of things how to improve how to cope up with the customer requirement we are more 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 and more humble to the customer so we must improve our equipments and references also we cannot rely on our old grand old equipment compliance standards we cannot say last time people had habit i am iso 17025 i am not iso 151189 i am not 13485 so sorry you don't edit me like that and today there is a situation you cannot say like that you can, you if you say you lost a customer so this is the thing so all these things sorry for my glitches i will apologize for you guys because i think i don't know what is happened uh later i will figure out is a end my presentation ends for here i hope you all learn something improving quality in laboratory op operations but our quality journey let it continue thank you thank you for all thank you mr shetty so yeah i think it was a wonderful session with a lot of information to digest yeah now let's open the floor for questions so mr shreya so i request you to turn on your video So let's have uh, your whole video on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So participants, uh, I think uh, now we have listened to all three talks, and I see only one question so far. That's for me. Other than that, I don't see any questions. So I'm not sure whether you are going to ask. Uh, through a voice call or you are going to type something it would be good to have some idea you know so then so can i request all participants to type have question or no questions because if you don't have question also we have our own questions <laughs> so yeah so let us know because uh, one thing that i wanted to ask you all because when you signed up for this training Uh, you might have got some kind of expectations you know that oh i wanted to like learn about this or i want to know about this was it addressed or was it missed so that's a first question that i have so please feel free to write that okay so oh i want to know about this that was not discussed so at least we will try to address that so that's the first thing and yeah if you have any other questions uh, either like you can do a raise hand and and like unmute yourself and ask or you can type out okay so while waiting for those questions so let me uh, talk about like Okay, that's one question about the EN score. So I think the EN score I have explained a bit uh, clear, but yeah, maybe we can do it one more. 
one more time. So you want me to, maybe I will share my screen, then it's easier. Uh, I think, uh, Karthik, there is one question from Hero, Hero about uh, four times better yeah, 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 yeah. Accuracy. I will let me answer for that question yeah, first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, just give me, give me a second. Okay. Uh, Hero, uh, actually, there are two things, uh, especially in, uh, uh, you know, that uh, Z541, the Americans uh, standard, which is also similar to 17025, they are more emphasizing on TUR nowadays. Last time it is TAR, test accuracy ratio. Very olden days, uh, people are saying your reference equipment must be 10 times better than your device under test or unit under test. But after a period of time, when device under test are getting uh, what they call uh, digital, electric, sorry, electronically digitized, we can see two decimal, three decimal, no more this uh, 10 times. So, slowly it reduced for four times. There is a guideline. I have to go and find out. Uh, once if I find out, I can share with you this one. I, maybe I threw either by uh, uh, Dr. Karthik or maybe you can directly write to me. Uh, my email ID is there. So uh, I will, uh, if you share your email ID, I can. So the four times better uh, is it was there on test accuracy ratio. Now, after the traceability and uncertainty getting more and more uh, stringent, especially in uh, some of the critical measurements and testing and calibration aspects, test uncertainty ratio is getting more and more hot. Test accuracy ratio is no more already. So you cannot refer both for, for your kind information. Test accuracy ratio, if you refer, you don't refer test uncertainty ratio because that not necessarily a high resolution or high accuracy item is instrument or reference is better, giving you better uncertainty if you are getting calibrated by any traceability means because it is also depending upon the measurement range. Sometimes what happens, you can see the test uncertainty ratio. Nowadays, majority of the laboratories are very good. They are giving the test uncertainty rate ratio for individual measurement ranges. But st still, there are some laboratories are practicing overall measurement uncertainty for all the measurements. But I prefer individual measurement uncertainty. So then you have easy life, an easy way to follow test uncertainty ratio. Test accuracy ratio is slowly, slowly vanishing out. Why it is vanishing out, my American lecturer told me, it is because of the digitization or resolution getting increases. Sometimes electron, sometimes when you see there is some instrument, electronic instruments have higher resolution, three resolution, four resolution, five resolution. It doesn't mean that this resolution is the precision or it can be measure the most minimum uh, the digit, it is not the meaning. It is actually electronically what they did. They did divided, one divided by 10, one divided by 100. The good way is if you got a filter, then you can see the filter function in that equipment. You fix the filter, then you see within a minute, within a, a, a second, how, how much it will, be, uh, uh, it will be deviate. So then you will know. So that's why I'm not encouraging for test accuracy ratio nowadays, but test uncertainty ratio, yes. Is it, um, I am answering for your question, uh, Mr. Hero? Yeah, I think uh, yes. Shetty, yeah. thank you so much, thank you so much. Yeah, it was yeah, okay. a right answer, so thanks, uh, Shetty. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, let me just uh, quickly share my screen to explain about this. Uh,
Okay, you guys see see it now? Do you see? Uh, are you able to see my screen? Okay, yeah. So this is what the EN score calculation. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, you have this smaller x that is the participant lab value, and this is the assigned value. Okay. Then, so that means you get the difference of this. And, okay, then at the denominator is basically the combined uncertainty, okay, of the PT provider, so that's reference, and the combined uncertainty of your lab. So these two, you actually square it first, then you do the square root, then, yeah, basically you'll get this. Maybe I can ex uh, show it in Excel. Uh, you see, let me. Okay, so these numbers I'm just throwing, or oh, let's say something like a cadmium in, in, in uh, wastewater, something like that. So the assigned value is point. Uh, let's say six, something like that, okay? And you are the participant lab, let's say you have 8.1. So the combined uncertainty of uh, the uh, PT provider, okay? The value of PT provider, generally it will be like, let's say, 0 0.5 and the lab okay this is yeah so these numbers can be different but i'm just trying to show you how this works okay so this one you square root first okay so that means this Okay, square root. So same, you do the square root of this. Okay, then you do the sum of, uh, this is square, so square root is then this plus this. So this is the denominator. So this one, the difference will be like uh, 8.6 minus 8.1, so yeah. Basically, what you see here is this over this. Yeah. So when you get something less than one, then you are basically okay. So this is what you will see it. So is it is it clear? So maybe you can turn on your mic and mute yourself and let me know whether uh, did I answer your question correctly or you need more explanation. So it is considered satisfactory, yeah, anything one or less, okay. Anything above one, that means unsatisfactory, you have to really look into that. Okay, uh, Mr. Shetty, do you want to add anything from calib calibration lab in terms of the EN score, EN, EN score ratio? Okay, for me, uh, let's say if a calibration lab of course, uh, theoretically, if your EN ratio is less than one for auditors, maybe auditor, auditors may accept, uh, depends upon some auditors. I think uh, Mr. Yao is here, he's a auditor, so I don't know what is his opinion. But uh, what I found from my uh, studies, let's say if your EN ratio is exceeding 0 0.6, all the laboratories, participant laboratories, their EN ratio is uh, somewhere around 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. You are suddenly exceeding 0 0.6 or something. It is some. It is the time for you to do some uh, corrective action. The one way is the doing corrective action. You can immediately trigger one interlab comparison because PT test is if you are not a authorized uh, approved PT. 
पीटी परफॉर्मिंग एजेंसी और लैब देन इट इज डिफिकल्ट फॉर पीटी यू हैव टू वेट फॉर एनएमसी और एचएसए टू कंडक्ट पीटी बट इंटरलैब और पीटी यू कैन कंडक्ट इंटरलैब यू कैन कंडक्ट एंड यू कैन प्रूव uh where went wrong 0.6 you can only conduct for that particular outlier which one of that particular reading or maybe uh if it is whole i i am not sure i'm not very much experience on chemical and uh, uh chemical side but uh because you have z score or this thing so in mechanical and calibration side the pt once if it is exceed 0.6 you need to activate your corrective action your side but auditor may not be asking for you but 0.9 and babu definitely the auditor will ask and they will ask they will want to see something action from you so this is what my opinion uh, dr kartik yeah, yeah i think yeah, uh, is auditor ms rao here yeah uh, <laughs> uh, for my experience actually for chemical and uh, microbiological as well as um, uh, environmental testing field actually we don't look at the en figure for the lab but we look at the z score okay uh, and the z score of course uh, we we take the plus 2 and minus 2 to be acceptable so should the lab has any figure even more than 2 less than 3 we also like to ask have you done anything have you look into the 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 the, the reason why you have a, a little bit higher than the rest then uh, if it's plus 3 or minus 3 definitely we want to see the corrective action uh, report or the car see what have they done to to rectify or to 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 ascertain why their result here so are not uh, within the 95% cohort values yeah so we don't look at ea but we look at z yeah, score yeah, yeah. mostly in chemical yeah, and environmental testing mostly z score is z score is what yeah, most commonly correct. looked yeah, and that is a little more straight forward also okay i think one uh, more uh, last one question. more rosa rosa question can yeah. i i i can answer for that yeah, i think you are the right yeah. person <laughs> no uh actually the particularly the air sampling uh, there is always a challenge on how good is your air sampling because the population means the air itself either in the stack or in the source uh, stationary source the the population is not constant the uh, what i call the volume the flow rate the constituents of the pollutants are not so called stationary they are keep on changing so so even you do a side by side comparison between two labs you don't really get any good reasonable uh, good result to compare so i think it is always a challenge uh, that's why there is no official pt program for doing uh like the cost source emission testing and particularly all the air uh air sampling because if you cannot be a certain the the homogeneity of the uh the the pollutants except probably except the indoor air quality i iaq probably that is uh, uh the best that you can uh, talk about doing any uh inter laboratory testing but uh ross suggested whether if it if it's done intra lab by comparing the different staff it is actually possible because uh, I, in this uh, eurachems uh, guide for sampling uncertainty actually one of the ways that they talk about is to compare two samplers meaning two person or three person taking the sample and see how they do it so only the difference is from the intra and inter lab is the equipment it might be different equipment because different labs have their different way of doing things they have their own uh, equipment have different calibration standard and so on if it's doing intra within then you may have this uh one variation less because you are might be testing on the same equipment 
So you only see the variability of person to person. So that is still not exactly uh, the meaning of uh, comparison for, from that aspect. But I think you just have to do the best and then explain to the auditor that that is the best I can do. That's it. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And principal right PT or interlab is recommended. But uh, in a situation like this, and this is the best option, so auditors will understand also. Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay, if no further questions, so that's one more. So Mr. Riao yeah. has an appointment, so he has to leave. So, okay, I think uh, if any other questions, so otherwise I'm going to wrap up uh, the session here. So please let me know if, if, if you have any questions. So I assume everybody's silent means uh, no more questions. So once again, okay, so I would like to thank Mr. Riau and Mr. Shetty for uh, your sharing. So definitely it has given some kind of insight, okay. So even though we are trying to follow some standard and implement, definitely there is always room for improvement and you have highlighted some of the things which they have to uh, like take a note and definitely it will help them. And uh, one point. Yeah. One point, uh, Doctor, do you want to share the, 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 the presentation slide? Yes. Or? Yeah, 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 please. Yeah. So uh, please send me so I will so I'll consolidate send you and yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, Shady has already sent it. So I have mine. So because some of the participants already requested. So let us, uh, as long as you don't have any confidential information, please share. So if you have yeah. anything, you can get rid of that one. And yeah, so all participants uh, make use of uh, his expertise like Mr. Riau. He's always available for any consultancy. Mm -hmm. or like uh, for group uh, activity within the lab also he is okay so please engage him wherever you think that he will be uh, set for that so yeah i i thank all participants also for your your patience and i hope at least you have got some useful uh, insight from this training and which you can take back and use it in your lab thank you all and let us close the session bye bye yeah okay thank you thank you bye thank you Thank you all. Yeah. Thank yeah. you all. All right.